All right. So uh, we're going to call to order the uh, meeting of the planning board for March 6th, uh, 2018. All right. So, uh, Gene, why don't we start? So tonight, the majority of the agenda is to cover warrant articles that have been proposed to date, not necessarily filed and um, on the warrant at this point. So they're proposed discussion items. Um, the calendar is moving quickly. So the public hearing process will begin on April 3rd, and that will again allow for three public hearings of the zoning articles that make it to the warrant. That being said, I need to be to the Tribune on March 15th, which is prior to your next meeting on March 20th. Um, it goes to the Tribune on the 15th for print dates of the 20th and 27th for the hearing date of the 3rd. So, so what will you need from us tonight? Tonight, any that you um, have been asked to sponsor and you would like to sponsor, I would like to have that um, because then we can, if, if you're okay with the draft, we can work towards submitting those and drafting the legal notice. Okay. Um, so we have everything on the agenda will be heard tonight. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just jump a little bit out of order. We're going to go uh, to the annual town meeting, potential zoning art amendment, warrant articles, and we're going to do the 505 Sutton Street first. Yes. All right. So can, if you can just give us a brief introduction. Yeah. So I believe Town Manager Andrew Baylor is here. Um, Erica Forey is here as well. It, it is listed as 505 Sutton Street, and that is what I thought it was when I posted this agenda. Um, however, it is comprised of 477 Sutton Street, a vacant parcel on Sutton Street, which has a address in the system as 499, I believe, and then 505 Sutton Street. And, I believe we dis and we discussed this at, at our, our last briefly, meeting briefly. Very at the last meeting. It, it's comprised of a um, partnership project with a independent developer for a multifamily housing complex as well as a relocation of our senior center. Okay. Mr. Mailer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Planning Board, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. And I certainly, um, I know there'll be a series of questions, so I'll save time to do that. Let me give you an overview of of the town's objectives relative to this project. Uh, we have, uh, back in 2012, adopted a facility master plan which included seven public projects. Uh, certainly the community is pretty familiar with those projects as have been uh, developed over the last several years. Six out of seven on that project was a senior center addition to this building out back. Uh, always assumed to be not the ideal solution to what goes on with our senior center. This building wasn't originally developed as a senior center. Over time, it, 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 it morphed into a senior center and there were some improvements to the facility uh, several years ago, more than a decade ago, which have helped. But as we know, the senior population is growing. The nature and needs of the senior population are changing. And so as part of the facility master plan adopted in 2012, again, as project six was the expansion of the facility out back, uh, two primary problems was the programmatic ability or the, the inflexibility within the existing structure out back and the parking, and we can talk about that in any depth you'd like, but the parking out back is uh, some days more than adequate and in some days uh, woefully inadequate, uh, especially on bingo days. Um, really a uh, tough day to be outside parking, certainly for everybody who comes here, whether the people are visiting the post office or working in this building or going to the senior center. Uh, so we've been, uh, even though it was project number six, as a part of uh, the, the development of that uh, facility master plan, it became evident that the kindergarten facility needed to be moved up in the program and that we were less clear about what we should be doing with the senior center. The senior center was moved to project seven. It currently sits in the town manager's um, capital improvement plan, which has already made it through the finance committee and the board of selectmen as being funded for next year. That's the senior center project at about $6 million. And it comes backboned by this particular development that you have on the screen uh, behind you and I know also in front of you. First came as a concept from a member of the Board of Selectmen who suggested that we acquire the property when there was a conversation about a rel residential development. Uh, Selectman Smedili introduced that idea to me uh, probably close to two years ago. Uh, from the size of the site and for various other reasons, uh, Towns acquiring property is not the simplest approach, and when they, those sites are larger than what you historically need, they become more difficult. We have to justify the need of the whole site. I won't bore you with all the details. Uh, but it jumps out at a conversation with uh, Lou Minicucci and Minco about the prospect of partnering on the site. We don't do a lot of public-private partnerships. They're, they're unusual in municipal government, but quite frankly, are often born out of um, 
situations like this where we felt like we had an opportunity to locate a senior center within about a mile radius of the downtown here, which has always been our goal, that if we were going to look at alternative sites, we wanted to be within about a mile as the crow flies back to Main Street and to uh, the mall here and some of the business uh, and industry that's here, and two, uh, to partner with a developer to come up with a proposal which was uh, less dense than we think, thought otherwise would be developed on the site and possibly uh, market or at least develop the site in a way which may be supportive of or work in conjunction with the senior center in terms of the nature of the tenants that may be there. So uh, over many months and with the help of um, Erica Forey and Suzanne Egan and the remarkable open-mindedness of the developer to look at something that's unusual, uh, what you have before you is a really rough sketch of what that partnership would look like. And that is a, a senior center sitting on a parcel that today currently contains a residential home uh, that's been acquired by Menco. Uh, 80 dedicated parking spots for the senior center. Uh, we can certainly talk about parking as much as you'd like in terms of that site. And fitting uh, the residential development on the same site and uh, having it be a market rate development. I'm sure Lou Minacucci is here. He can talk in more detail about that particular aspect of the project. Uh, there's some zoning changes that would be required to uh, allow this to happen, but we believe overall that the residential development proposed in this case, less units, the unit uh, makeup is different than otherwise would have been happened on the site, and overall it's less impactful to the neighborhood than what would be otherwise moved forward if, if the town did not partner with Minco. And so that's the concept before you. Um, the footprint on the senior center is just south of 10,000 square feet. We see that ultimately to be somewhere between a 13 and 14,000 square foot senior center. So there would likely be a second story on that building. In fact, you should expect a second story as we proceed. Um, if we do it correctly, we may build a second story where half is complete and half is not so that if, if the nature, and again, make sure we have the expansion capabilities of dealing with uh, the direction of our senior population over the upcoming years. So that's a, an overview of what this site looks like, what we're proposing. Uh, we certainly want to recognize and appreciate the efforts of Minco to work with us to try to find a compromise and balance of needs between the public and the private, and we think this project represents that. So, so what, would, what could be built there as of right now? What, was the, what would the project be if, if the town wasn't involved? From your understanding. Yeah, and I think others can maybe get into a little more detail than I, but I, I've seen proposals here that called for a little over 160 units, maybe 164 units. Um, those, those that would be allowed through under the zoning and those that would be allowed under a comprehensive permit, those could be you know, dramatically different things. Um, I think that the elevation on the site, if it went, for instance, as a comprehensive permit as an alternative, uh, may have been more stories. This is a proposed four-story structure. I think we would have seen some, some cases where that could have been five stories and some places. I think at least one initial drawing saw this with more structures on the site, uh, more density, uh, closer to the residential neighborhood, which on this screen is on the bottom side of the screen. I think some of the initial proposals put it closer to those setbacks and to those residential houses. And we were particularly uh, mindful of the fact in conversations with the developer that not only did we need space for a senior center and adequate parking, but we also thought there should be less density in the lot and, and that the facility, the building, should be moved further away from the back property lines because we wanted to uh, reduce the impact on the residential neighborhoods that sit behind this development. Does anybody else have questions? I have a question. Uh, Gene had earlier mentioned that this is really a, a combination of a, a think three lots does the senior center proposed senior center sit on a specific lot yes so uh, they're oddly shaped so I'm not sure I can uh, describe them well but the the square here as opposed to the uh, I'm somewhat colorblind but the orange colored um, senior center off to the side is on its own lot which is currently the the has a residential home on it uh, the remaining space is comprised of two lots um, sort of a wrap around the back L's to the, the space. So if you start at the senior center, front of the senior center, come back to the back side of the lot and turn right, um, that's a second parcel. And then where the uh, current building sits today, the KFC site, uh, which is sort of the, the remaining piece would be the third. So three sites, but the senior center is on a specific a site. Under our requirements, since this would be donated land, really highly unusual and something that, again, we should recognize the developer for their interest in wanting to do that. 
we would need town meeting approval to accept the donation of land. And so we'd need to properly be able to delineate not only the parking but also the building um, to make sure that what's before town meeting clearly allows us to take the donation of land. So that under state statute is a, is a town meeting approval is required for the acceptance of donated land. And the, the construction, the funding of the building itself, is that through the town's capital? Yeah, so the, so the agreement with the development, developer is that this will be site pad ready. So we're reducing the overall cost in terms of development from our perspective. So these schematics and some of the initial drawings will also come from the developer. Again, these are gifts in essence. Uh, the town has funded is approximately five point, I don't have the exact dollar amount, but just south of $6 million in the fiscal 19 capital plan. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this was uh, in the capital plan I provided to the Board of Selectmen. That's been approved. It's gone on to Finance Committee and was approved two weeks ago by the Finance Committee. So uh, that's moving on to town meeting with the approval of full funding for that senior center as you see in that site. Thank you. Um, Does anybody want to talk about the, uh, the zoning proposal? Sure. And I mean, I think I understand why B2 was picked, but I mean, are there any you know, the part of the problem obviously is B2 allows a multitude of uses and typically if we do something like this, we would covenant out certain uses in advance just to be clear about what we're, we're allowing here. So, I mean, yeah. uh, and again, I don't know if we're in full compliance with every single requirement under B2 with this proposal. Yeah, I'd, I'd refer that to, to Mr. Kafori who's here who can speak to that. I think any time we, I don't think you'd want to ask me to speak about zoning too often, so I'll let him do that. Uh, I'll be back. I'm not going. Uh, <clears throat> so currently the two parcels are in general business. And <clears throat> when you compare the uses that are allowed essentially in general business in B2, there really isn't all that much difference. So we're not really uh, providing um, anything substantially different when it comes to commercial uses. The B2, though, allows uh, multifamily as a right based on special permit. Yeah. So that was the big difference between B2 and uh, general business. Right. I mean, arguably, there's perhaps a loophole in the B2 that if we allowed residential, we didn't put any limits on density. Obviously, mm -hmm. in this case, the density would be higher than I think in any other residential district. But but you know like are all the setbacks in conformity is the uh, the lot, the coverage ratio in conformity all those things yes so uh, we looked at that I think what you're seeing before you now is within the setbacks um, of B two uh, B two also allows uh, planning board to waive height requirement up to 55 feet. Um, and that's the proposal, uh, the other zoning change we're asking is, um, but no more than four stories, uh, four multifamily uses only. So is this is this is the one that uh, on the Fajetta, which, you know, Fajetta moved under. Yeah. <clears throat> and so there was a requirement on that originally for five acres. Um, we're proposing actually in looking at all of the B2 uh, uh, so you are making a zoning change here, yes. in addition to... to yes, so yeah. the zoning change is to eliminate the five acres requirement. I have a copy of that. You yeah, to okay. There were two. Okay. I mean, yep. it, you know, I mean, the problem with that is that now we've got to go through and think about what the consequences of that be separate from this project. Right, and so, and that was, we, we had done the same thing, and I think when you take a hard look at the other sites in B2 that um, so we can, could or would take advantage of it, which I know, I, I believe you might have been providing yeah, some of those. Like, we see the other sites? So why don't we, why don't we, well, why don't, I think we should come back to that discussion. Yeah. So I think we should make that, maybe let's make that a separate discussion because we do have a chart with that, and I actually think it's an important discussion, and there's, mm -hmm. At least I know I, have, I do have some concerns about that. So why don't we focus on the development portion and then this, and then we'll come back to the change about the height. Sure. Um, so let's come back yeah, to that. Okay. So did any, were there any more questions regarding? Question, Peter, right? you had a question. Um, yeah. Is it possible for you just to give a quick sort of background on the senior center piece that were there other locations or sites considered just in the sort of history of yeah. what do we do with the senior center? Yes, 
Uh, so not a, a full analysis in a way that we traditionally do, and I think that's because we had a couple of different constraints. One was we had to remain close to uh, what we thought, so it was a clear decision to stay close to the Main Street. Um, seniors expect to have their, their primary core businesses somewhere in this area, so as soon as we got, say, to the common outward, it didn't make any sense. So it really narrowed that sort of field division to very uh, limited number of sites. Anytime a municipality gets into the discussion of acquiring land, that gets very complicated. So from our perspective, the idea of an acquisition was also challenging um, in the sense that for us it's eminent domain. It means a taking. There's no such thing as a friendly taking in municipal government. Uh, we have a bylaw that says when we can do a taking. And so as you start to get into those constraints, Mr. Boynton, you realize that there really there wasn't this option where we would just go pick the ideal site and get into a conversation with a neighbor about purchasing the property. Um, it really became an opportunity to solve the problem of the appropriate location within a mile of the downtown, adequate parking, um, and the ability to address a collateral concern that has been identified to the Board of Selectmen on multiple occasions, and that is an adequate parking in the Main Street corridor. So let me tell you that the part of the reason this all works for everybody involved. Uh, not only we're we locating a senior and putting 80 <coughs> parking spots here, we're then freeing up the parking spaces out back to address the broader concern of what happens as we bring development to Main Street and where we're going to locate parking. On a parallel track to the senior center conversation, um, I had had conversations with the board and had done work with um, Ms. Enright and others about the possibility of identifying uh, sites along Main Street to purchase just to locate parking. The cost associated with the acquisition of those properties and to make it into parking meant the town would have spent between a million and a million and a half dollars just to create adequate parking to support an expanded senior center and its impact on the parking lot out back. So it became a number of different factors. We looked within that one mile out radius, looked for cases where, you know, where can we, is there town owned land in that, in those kinds of environments? Because again, us acquiring land is, is a complicated process, and then looked for opportunities where we could um, create the supported parking to the senior center and free up this parking lot for the benefit of supporting Main Street in the long term. Um, and so it was all of those pieces together that made this site uh, logical. But quite frankly, if it wasn't a site that was ripe for redevelopment, it would never, the discussion wouldn't have taken place and therefore we wouldn't have ended up there. Was there any, um is there any history of considering the um, former textile museum in the old center as a senior center? Yes. So uh, a couple of limitations with no criticism to the particular property. Uh, trying to locate 80 parking spots on a site that currently contains, uh, you know, two buildings. It's really three buildings, but two buildings on that particular site. There's no way that could have contained the 80 parking spots, even if we take down, took down a portion of the museum space. Right. For us, parking is essential. Seniors don't carpool. Right. They drive one at a time. And again, I'll refer back to bingo days. Um, and so the idea of having constrained parking there would have been a real challenge on that site. Additionally, um, it's approximately 12,000 square feet of the usable square footage. And I think for us, um, it gets us a little under where we need from a program perspective. Uh, the second story of that building is not, you know, full, it's, it's, again, the building's laid out well. I think it's a good building. Very much support uh, keeping the, the sort of front of that building in that area. Mm -hmm. But for us, it provided some real restrictions in terms of reuse. And even from a cost of renovation perspective, um, I think in a public construction environment, the requirements of that building would have been such that they wouldn't, the cost to reconstruct would not have been that much significant um, or that much different than building new. So all of those provided limitations that choosing that site would have meant that 10 years down the road we would have asked why we picked that site and where the next senior center was going to be and we wanted to try to avoid that. And I think just one last question for me. The calculation of 80 parking spots for this proposal, does, mm. does the 80 include that central parking area, is that, yeah, is that's that a great for question. the housing? So what I would say is this, as it relates to that, so uh, everybody's been working really diligently to get all this, you know, get uh, these questions answered and, and on a piece of paper. Um, 
as we know, we're early in a process here. So through the normal site plan review process and others, this is going to continue to evolve. So if I look at that dotted line as an example, I don't expect that in the permanent, in the final plan to be a dotted line. It'll be more segregated to the senior center parking because right now it's a dotted line. So if you follow the dotted line up and then, again, I, I guess it's just follow the dotted line, right? I, I um, don't and, see the dotted line. Okay. Gray. Who is a pointer? The contour line? Isn't that a contour? No, just a dotted okay. line. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Got I it. follow. Yeah, got it. So it's hard to see. So if you follow that dotted line and then it travels, um, <coughs> I'm not great in directions, but it travels to my left um, down toward sort of the other property line. Yep. I think in, the, in whatever happens finally here, that'll actually be more segregated. So maybe that's a berm with landscape in between. So, to, so here's how we envision the use of the property. Uh, it'll be clear and evident that there is 80 parking spots for seniors to use during the regular hours of the senior center. But I fully expect that on Sundays and, and most nights and in and, and most weekend days, Saturdays and Sundays and most nights, uh, these spots would have uses for whoever was here visiting the folks in the residential side. So clearly 80 spots identified for the seniors during the time that they need it. Um, uh, based on our current zoning, I think that means an occupancy of 320, if I've done the math right. Uh, I don't think we get that today, but I think we'll grow into that over time. And then we would see last night, today, you know, the programs that we currently hold at the Senior Center don't have a night and weekend use. And therefore, those spaces would at least be accessible. So I wouldn't see a fence there. But I would see landscape ele uh, elements that would make it clear it's for that parking. But beyond those traditional times, uh, there's no reason others couldn't park there. And I guess I do have just one more question. I mean, sure. uh, and I'll try to be good after that. Um, I, I take your point that, it, you know, to be within a mile of downtown, but there's really no place that seniors could go out and take a short walk here, and it's unlikely they're going to walk a mile to the downtown. So, I mean, does this meet our goals yeah. in terms of a place that seniors, you know, could not only take advantage of the building but go outside and, I mean, where, where would they go? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that's, again, you're using a series of choices. Right. So if I set out back, what I'd be talking about is a 50% addition to a building that doesn't isn't programmatically correct already. Right. Adding that into a compromised parking lot, <coughs> and maybe they can walk to Main Street, but yeah. we don't have the adequate space, and we continue to put seniors in, in a, we, we make them by um, omission or commission secondary to other concerns and, and, and services we have. Mm -hmm. This building will service the needs of the seniors um, as relates to programmatic needs better than an expansion of that building is, and it's not close. Mm -hmm. um, is it perfectly walkable to certain neighborhoods? No. Um, is, do we need to connect a lot of our different resources? I would say yes. If you put them at the common area, example, they could walk around the common, but they're not going to today walk all the way down Main Street. No. Um, I think we as a community are committed to making our community more walkable. I'd say it is uh, you know, a 1A priority to everything we do. Um, we're heavily focused on adding more sidewalks in the community to make them for kids and families and adults more walkable. And I think this would be this would help us focus this area as well. Um, and I think in the long term, we'd connect to more, you know, to the mill area and to the downtown. Uh, but it represents an opportunity to address the programmatic needs of the seniors that a, an expansion of the building out back <coughs> just won't do. I had uh, one more question. Um, you had mentioned earlier that uh, siting was was brought forward to limit the impact on the residential area. Uh, behind the sites. Um, has there been a discussion uh, in terms of uh, other things that you're looking to do to minimize the impact on the residents um, on Surrey Drive, such as um, uh, lighting, noise, et cetera? I think that would go specific to the site plan review process of the development when you get into the kinds of specifics that can answer those questions. Uh, from our perspective, it's um, we're looking at the site as this dual use, but but I wouldn't take your actions at this point as uh, being at the level of detail that you'll get into as the permitting sure. process continues. I think that that's a ongoing conversation. Do we have any? I mean, just to follow on that point, and I sure. get that that uh, there's a chicken and egg thing here, but some sort of rough idea of the building concept, you know, the, the massings of the buildings and so forth, because 
we're approving a zoning of a particular parcel that sure. has a certain look and feel, and I think it's it's fair to be open about what's going to happen versus what's not going to be happen, and be fully transparent to the extent possible about that. Yeah, I think that's uh, to me it's one of the benefits of par of partnering from our perspective. I think we would have struggled. Uh, meeting the town when I say we, the town would have struggled having this kind of conversation with a developer we're not familiar with uh, because we could have talked all we wanted, but we wouldn't have known. Uh, we've seen the product. Um, I think this developer is well known in the community, has been involved uh, for you know decades in the community, and as a result, I think when they show us products that they've done similarly, um, either in this community or other communities, it's consistent with what I think we would be comfortable with. In the end, we're putting a signature uh, product, uh, a town asset um, in this relationship with a private developer. So we feel comfortable based upon their experience and what they've delivered in the past and other places that there'll be, that this will represent the community and will be an improvement to what is currently a sort of blank slate. Let's remember directly across from this is self-storage areas, right? We've got a beautiful residential neighborhood behind it. Uh, but we think there's an opportunity to jump site economic development because on that site right now, again, is a, is a former KFC site. Directly across the street is self-storage on an airport property. Uh, we see some residential development down the street. So we see a real opportunity that this becomes um, a point of contact to the rest of the developable areas within the community. Again, the mills are developing, you know, meets and bounds. We think Main Street will do the same as we begin an undergrounding project. And we think this provides, um, from a reasonable distance perspective, some connection points that allow us to do that. So I, I feel comfortable with the developer we're partnered with. We wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case in the experience with that developer, that this project will represent what the community wants. And we see synergy between um, the nature of the final product that you're talking about, uh, the residential product, and the senior center product. We want them to look like they fit in the same space. They won't be identical, but we want to make sure that they're consistent with what we expect. So developers here? Is that right? Yes. Could, could maybe we hear from the developer about the kind of vision for the residential? That would be <coughs> helpful. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My, my name's Lou Minacucci. Uh, we don't, we don't really have a, an exact concept of what the architectural uh, aesthetics of the building would look like uh, at this point in time. We do have a massing plan, as you see, so you see the footprint of what the building will eventually look like. There's 136 units. You don't see a lot of parking. Well, you do see a fair amount of parking on the site, but the majority of the parking will be under the building so that there'll be a parking garage under. We envision that uh, many of the residents here would be uh, seniors, we're hoping, or 55 and over, although it's, it's open to any age group, but we suspect because of the relationship between our development and the senior center that there'll be some um, connection between the two. So what the exterior will look like, I mean, I think that's an evolutionary process. It's something that we probably would be getting feedback from from the planning board on, um, something that the architect would need to think about in terms of some other features that are, uh, exist within the community to come up with uh, what might be appropriate. So it's really hard to say. Um, some of, for some of the board members here that aren't uh, familiar with some of the things that we've done, um, uh, we have done uh, three other 40B projects here in North Andover, Kittredge Crossing, which is across the street from the 99 restaurant. Um, we just recently completed Berry Farm, where we restored the old farmhouse and built the 196 units up front. And further on down uh, on 114, we did the Meadows development, 260 unit project. I'll give you a, um, in Andover, we did Powder Mill Square. It's a brick building that's across from the McDonald's and the uh, post office. So it's an example of some of the projects we've, we've done. All of the architecture is slightly different. I think it really depends upon um, kind of, an, again, <coughs> for lack of a better term, an evolutionary process that is a combination of working with the planning board in this case and with Eric and, and the town and ourselves. So. We're proud of what we do at the end of the day. We want it certainly to look good. Um, there were a couple of questions that were brought up that uh, um, I think I could maybe add some additional information. It's currently 
general business, and then general business, as you know, is probably the most liberal zoning I think we have. Uh, we developed a stop and shop here in North Andover, and that was a that's general business as well. So the uses in the site could be many, uh, from a retail shopping center. Um, I'm suspecting, and I don't know this for sure, but probably a drive-up facility, a drive-in facility, a McDonald's or a Wendy's or something of that nature. Um, so there are a lot of different uses. I, I think the B2 use is probably a downgrade of a zoning. I know you were, uh, John, you were a little concerned about if you rezone an area, then you're pretty much at the mercy of the new zoning. I think a B2 is a downgrade from a general business. Um, I don't know if there's any other. The majority of uh, the unit sizes themselves will be one bedroom and two bedroom so. units. Um, and uh, you've asked what would we conceive of doing. Uh, we have, as, as you may know or you may not know, we do have a site approval letter from the state uh, to do a 40B project, which would be 164 units. We're <coughs> contemplating 136 units. It's a little bit of a full circle for me. Uh, about 45 years ago, I started my career as the director of the housing authority here in North Andover, and we built a number of different elderly housing projects. But the very first section of the senior center was a CBDG block grant, which was a federal grant that we had applied for. In fact, uh, uh, Ben Osgood is here, and Gaten and I had actually written the grant to receive the very first um, elderly uh, development, which was about 3,500 square feet at the time. And we all thought that was very big and would, would last for a long time, but, uh, uh, you know, we all know where we are today. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions I could ask. Did you have I'm not trying to be evasive on what the outside would look like, but we honestly haven't put that much effort or time into doing that other than to say we want it to look good, obviously, at the end of the day. Do you have any thoughts about either this particular project or how you generally handle mitigation in terms of, you know, if it's a pretty big building with a neighborhood behind it, how would you handle kind of, I think, Aaron's question about noise and light and things like that? Well, what, well what obviously, uh, under the site plan approval process, you go through photometrics and you, you go through ensuring that you don't have any light that spills over into other people's properties, which we would all be compliant with. Um, so I think typically the standard rules and regulations within the community generally would ensure that you are, I guess, become a good neighbor or you are a good neighbor. We, uh, we do have a 50-foot uh, setback uh, to the majority of the neighborhood. The 25 feet that you see to the right-hand side, that's uh, to the China Blossom, which is zone general business. Um, I, I think that at the end of the day, this would be a better use for the neighborhood. Um, and and uh, obviously, most all about us really would not like to see things change for the most part. I understand that. Uh, but this use, and, and this is not to threaten anybody, but this use is, and if I weren't in the picture, if somebody else, or if we were to sell this, if this site were to be reused as a general business site or potentially a 40B site that's been approved for, for a five-story building, um, I'm not certain that it would be as good, as respectful of the neighbors as this project is. But we're certainly cognizant of the concerns of the neighborhood. We'd want to ensure that things like uh, drainage and lighting and um, buffer zones are, are well respected and, and we would certainly do the best by our abutters. Any questions? So if not, why don't, if, um, thank you. Uh, if there any, if there's anyone from the public that wishes to speak, just have you come up to the microphone, uh, give your name and address, please, and then give us any statements or questions you'd, you'd like. Hi, I'm Patrick Hi. Duffy. Uh, my wife and I live at 59 Surrey Drive, which is uh, below the property to the right side, so the bottom right corner of the property. Uh, we spoke at, the, at the, our last meeting, and I just wanted to bring up uh, a couple more points. Um, 
that I hope you would consider and that the developer would consider as well. The, it's, Surrey Drive is an interesting neighborhood because we're less than half a mile from the train track, the sewage treatment plant, the airport, and a trash burning facility. And still, I find it to be a great place to live because of the buffer from the commercial areas. I, I don't notice the airport really at all. I don't notice, I didn't notice what used to happen at the Knights of Columbus. I don't notice what happens at China Blossom because of the buffer. We're very concerned about the buffer of the trees. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Minacucci mentioned a 50 foot setback. I went out there currently and, and measured the trees out there today. There are a line of mature trees at 45 feet. <coughs> a 50 foot setback, they'd have to destroy that line of mature trees that are sitting at 45 feet now. Uh, it, it's, um, so we're very concerned about that. And this appears to be a done deal by the town. The, obviously, a lot of effort has, has gone into this already. That the neighbor, uh, the, the abutters, we didn't know anything about what was going on, the discussions with the town and the developer. But I would really encourage everyone to consider the changes to the character of the neighborhood. Four-story building, it, it, just, it just doesn't fit in that area. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I am Rachel Scarry, and I live in 19 Surrey, which is the plot of land adjacent to the senior center and that facility. So currently, our backyard views are trees. And there's a residential home right there. We just moved to town in June. Um, we have a four-year-old son who loves to play in our beautiful neighborhood. And I have quite a few concerns. One is that China Blossom, the commercial building on the backside, has more lawn and more you know, space versus both sides of my fence would now have parking. And from the schematic, there are no trees or landscaping or anything to replicate the current situation that we have from our backyard. Our backyard now, in the summertime, it's just trees. And you know, as our neighbor said, there's a buffer. It's a quiet neighborhood, despite having an airport and, and different things around. This would drastically change our environment and what we bought into when we bought the home in June. Um, I'm concerned about the traffic pattern because now we're adding 136 units, which would effectively be 250 parking spaces, I'm assuming, at two spaces a unit. So now, with the traffic light at China Blossom and the traffic light at Richdale, has there been a, an assessment as to how the traffic pattern will change? Will Surrey Drive now be a cut through for people who are stuck at the light at China Blossom and stuck at the light at Richdale? So now, what's now a quiet street where our kids play in every home because there are many kids ranging from four up playing in the streets on their bikes. Now will this be a cut through? Um, the other question I do have for the developer is, is the plan, you know, how many spaces exactly are there? Because now there will be vehicles moving in our backyard right against our fence from both sides. Um, the lighting, I was happy to hear that there would be some addressment of, of lighting because currently we don't have spotlights in our backyard um, you know would the developer be okay with putting trees on either side of the fence or doing something a little bit more respectful of our current property I, I get the the social implications of having a senior center and things like that but I'd ask you to think if if you own that house that I own how would you feel finding out three days ago that this is gonna drastically change everything so for me, it's emotional. So I would just ask when you make these decisions and talk about extending things in height, if this is what you were looking at in your backyard, how would you feel? As, as so um, to th thank you, Ms. Gary. We'll get, try to get a couple of answers to these if we have them. Just uh, one thing for, for everyone to know is that what we're at, being asked to do, it's great to have this drawing and to get your feedback because that'll help the process as it goes on. What we're being asked right now is to consider a zoning change, which would potentially allow, potentially allow these projects. They would still need site plan review. They would still potentially need at least the re um, residential might need a special permit, right? Um, so none of this is set in stone. This 
what the, this process could allow this a later process where this could occur. So these are good questions. There, we just there may not be answers to all of the questions right now, but they're good questions to address. So I guess I would ask um, if there are any traffic or parking studies, and then if we could get from Mr. Minicucci about the parking spaces, any information we have about that would be helpful. One and one more. Question. I'm sorry. Is Section Eight or part of this also would be another question I'd have as a resident. Okay. So I believe the answer to the last one is that it's the object that with this project that's not happening. But there are going to be market rate rentals is right. what There's is going to be what? Market rate rentals have been proposed. Okay. So. So I don't know who wants to field if we want it. You can, if you, whatever information you have, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I, I guess just to, to clarify, uh, this is not a Section 8 based housing development. If I'm not sure that that was the question asked, but they wanted to know if there was any Section 8. So as we talked about before, the 40B had 25% affordable set aside. And even under that scenario, there is no Section 8. There's no subsidies, but uh, there's 25% affordable units. Under this plan that we're proposing, there is no affordable units. There's 136 market rate units. In terms of parking, typically on a, <coughs> on a multifamily development uh, of this nature, there's a, uh, as a rule of thumb, you need approximately 1.5 cars uh, per unit. Uh, and uh, we are proposing in this particular uh, project to uh, have some uh, studio units and some one bedrooms because, again, as we talked about earlier, I'm not sure exactly what the profile or the demographics of, of our tenants are going to be, but my suspicion is that there's going to be, it's going to be heavily weighted uh, towards uh, an older 55 and over crowd. And uh, as we have an aging population, uh, there are there aren't as many alternatives uh, for seniors today. Um, <coughs> there's very costly nursing homes and then there's assisted living, but there's very few market rate housing units that are gonna be convenient to the downtown shopping, in this case, the senior center. So we, we will have uh, one and a half cars, roughly. Uh, your zoning bylaw under B2 requires one, one and a quarter uh, park, uh, car, uh, parking per studio, one and a half for one bedroom, and two for a two bedroom, which we find is, is, is higher than we would typically need. At any rate, under, also under your zoning, it would allow some shared parking considerations, no more than 35%, and collectively between what's being provided at the senior center and what's being provided um, on our site in combination with the parking under the building. I mentioned before, the, the parking garage right now is about 104 uh, parking spaces. Earlier on, uh, there were some other questions or issues that were, were brought up. And one of the uh, disadvantages of bringing forward a project like this, this is really only concept. And uh, as Eric and I were talking, this is a, this is a concept planned at about 30,000 square feet as we have to start uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of the project. We are going to be talking or need to talk about things uh, such as landscaping, fencing, buffers, lighting, noise, all of the considerations that you deal with on an everyday basis. The planning board, you know, typically has to address in all developments, and we have to address as well to ensure a successful project. Um, we would be working out, but we we're not we're only at the early stages of of the this development and coming up with, with a. I guess a final working set of drawings and plans to build this project as a year process. It doesn't happen in a, in a month or two. So can I ask a few questions? Please. So um, I heard you mention studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom. Are there any three bedrooms planned? No, there is not. Okay. No. And um, I appreciate your description of the parking. That's very helpful. The parking garage under the building, is that on grade level? or No, it's yeah. below grade. Below grade. Yeah. Um, and. Um, I think it's a, a great point, very consistent with the chairman's point that uh, this is not the actual project here. We're talking about a zoning change, so right. I don't expect you to have a lot of detail. Right. 
but with respect to the landscaping, can you give us, and maybe not, just a sense of what is your philosophy of landscaping in a proposal like this where there's two conditions. One is <clears throat> there's currently a, a deep uh, swath of fully mature trees, and it appears that some or most of that will have to go. Mm -hmm. And then the second condition is there's, there's a very small portion here, really two lots that abut directly. <coughs> and really no uh, room here for a, a lot of landscaping on the property of the parcel. So what's your philosophy, if you can share with us, in a development like that where you have these two conditions? How would you try to address that? Without the details. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I guess I would have to point you to some of uh, point you to some of the projects that we have currently developed sure. here, not the Andover. And uh, I think one of which that we work very closely with the planning board is Peachtree, which is a 29 lot uh, PUD here in North Andover. And if you go, if you were to drive through that subdivision, we had some green spaces, uh, open spaces, and a fair amount of not, I shouldn't say fair, a lot of landscaping that has matured. Mm -hmm. uh, that has pretty much been the case at Kittredge Crossing, if you were to drive through that, and at, uh, at the Meadows, which is the uh, development that we did out uh, on 114. Uh, the Riding Academy, uh, Academy uh, or Berry Farms, really hasn't had an opportunity to mature. But we use a fellow by the name of Chris Huntress, who has done all of our landscaping. He used to be the planner here in North End, probably about 30 years ago, um, um, and I had worked with him when I when I was with the Housing Authority and Community Development Department here mm -hmm. 40 years ago. But uh, he was he was here as the planner. He's very very talented, uh, has the best interests of the town at heart, yeah. and I think he's done some great work. And so, can I be specific on this project? No. Uh, I think what will end up happening will be left in Chris's hands for the most part. He's our landscape architect. Um, and uh, I don't know how else to answer that. Uh, in terms of the uh, setbacks of the 50 feet, um, we would try to preserve as much of those trees as possible. I, 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 I respect what Mr. Duffy had said that certain amount of those trees will have to go because of the root system and, and construction. But I don't anticipate all of them going. And there's a fair amount of trees that are on Mr. Duffy's land as well. So that, it, unless I'm mistaken, is that not correct? 10 feet. 10 feet, 10 feet. OK. The mature ones are, are, the mature ones are at, the, the really 40-year-old trees are at, are at the 45 OK. All right, well. Um, so there'll be 10 feet on their property, and then there'll be 45 on ours. We would obviously do whatever we could to preserve as many uh, as we could and as far back. But again, these are all smaller details that uh, are, are hard to work out right now. Can't give you definitive answers. Can't tell you what kind of shrubs there'll be, how much. Uh, I was just looking for your philosophy. So yeah, you've given us examples, and I appreciate Maybe if you could that. go see uh, Peachtree yeah. and some of these other sure. projects. That Thank you. I know John has worked on yep. some of them, Peachtree at least, and the ZBA was involved in the 40B project. So. You know. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Ford or, or Mr. Miller, do we have any information about, have you got considerations about um, traffic patterns, with at least with the senior center or with, uh, I mean, it is a, at least it, in my experience, more heavily would be used than at least the Knights of Columbus was. I'm not sure about the church, sure. but. Uh, well, a couple of things, if I can. Um, if we can step back, the, the assumption or the way we got here was starting with an assumption, and I understand this is, um, but I think it, it bears repeating, right? We, we, we got here because there was an assumption of a more dense residential development proposed on the site with smaller setbacks, more density, more density, more massing, more asphalt, and a higher building. And so, um, I don't view this project as sort of a fait accompli. I, I view it as an opportunity to look at a need for the town and an interest of the developer and see if we can start 
a process which ultimately needs to be completed by you folks about some of those details. We didn't set this with a blank slate with an opportunity that this was going to be uh, the next Whole Foods. I'm not sure that's a good answer either, but, but, but some other kind of use that may have necessarily been more um, acceptable or a park. We came to the table at, at the time in which what was proposed here was 164 units with three bedroom units and two bedroom units and one bedroom units. And again, uh, probably less green space and more density and more massing. And so I think it's important to start from that point and it doesn't mean there can't be further improvement or refinement to have less impact on the neighborhood. I, I can certainly understand the need to do that. Uh, two, just to Mr. Boynton's uh, specific point, I think the parking underneath proposal uh, below grade is an indication of Mr. Minicucci's interest, or however 30,000 feet we are, that, that there was other opportunities to place parking and create more <coughs> asphalt. And I think uh, as, a, as relates to a proposed design, the ability to go below grade in parking and add 100 spots under there means 100 less parking spots on grade, as is at least this proposal early on of this green space lawn, which you can't see on the top or north side over here along the street line. That could have been asphalt and parking as well. And I know that's not directly connected to the neighborhood, so I can understand that may have be of less interest. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not here to speak directly for Mr. Mitakushi, but I, I think those are some indications of, of the steps that he historically takes to make sure um, that we're sensitive to the neighbors. So I think that's important. <coughs> I, you know, all that stuff needs to happen. There's going to be traffic studies. Uh, I, again, I think we start from the perspective that we were likely going to have a more dense and more units you still would have had to go through a process where questions about traffic study and traffic flow and entrance and egress. It may, in the end of the day, this may not be the appropriate entrance and egress. Uh, the flow of the parking lot, the, the lighting that was described, whether we're adding more landscaping, all those things go through a site plan review process. Um, I would expect that with the senior center, you have the kind of traffic we get today, which is somewhere between 10 and 2 on a daily basis. That is the mo most active time. There's certainly activity at 8, more so at 10, um, departure typically between two and three. So I'd expect, I can't speak to the residential side, I can only speak to the senior center side, that's the most active time of use. Uh, we have no nighttime programs. I would expect as a public building on occasion you'll get some nighttime use for a public meeting or something like that, but I wouldn't expect where it'll be a you know, huge use in that regard. And I would expect that the developer will go through the same process he would have to go through if he was proposing 164 units or 200 units. Um, a site plan review process and where you folks get to weigh in as do the neighbors as a way to make sure that this project is as thoughtful to the neighborhood and to the developers possible. My question just as a follow on that <laughs> is, uh, and this is maybe a question more for Mr. Minicucci, but if, if we're talking, I don't know, 126, 128 units, uh, would you be willing to put a covenant saying that's the maximum that you would build on the property? Um, because I, I, I mean, it, it, I think you raise a, a, an important point that we should be aware of is the alternatives here uh, that Mr. Minicucci can do is he can go for the 40B for the 168 units. He has the full right to do that, right. or he has the rights to develop the property under the existing general business, which mean, could mean gas stations, fast food restaurants and so forth. So we're talking about something that is less intentious, which I think was your yeah. point. Uh, we should bear that in the context, but it would be good to know that, in fact, we could, you know, even though we can't guarantee what the project will look like, it seemed to me that we, we may want to have some idea of the number of units yes. as the cap. Well, let, let me uh, be specific about that. Um, this isn't cut blanche from the point of view, from the town's perspective, nor is it from the developer's perspective, right? The, the developer is going to, has expectations of what's uh, going to happen as does the town. So from our perspective, um, this is a project that cannot exceed 136 units, or we're not in anymore. Meaning from a senior center, our support for any zoning change, we're not in. This project cannot exceed four stories. Again, there's still a planning process, so other changes may happen. But from sort of a minimum threshold perspective, um, we do not accept that this should be a five-story structure, which is which it very much, very likely would have been. Um, if it changes further and it's three and a half or three stories, a three-year process, that's fine. But from a stop perspective, uh, from our perspective, uh, it didn't make sense for us to partner with a development that was five stories. So four is maximum from the town side in terms of an agreement we would have with the developer, 136 units okay. would be the maximum that we would have or we're not partnering. Um, and the setbacks of, of the 50 feet or greater is something that 
was a requirement of ours that weren't going to be required under the alternative proposal. And if it's less than that, unless the neighbors agree and say they want it less, for some reason I couldn't imagine, uh, from our perspective, we're not in any longer. Uh, we couldn't get, we didn't, we wanted to respect the public process that site plan review that the developer is going to have to go through, except set reasonable uh, thresholds over which we were not willing to partner with the developer. And there's been agreement to that. And his agreement is, if he doesn't get an alteration in zoning, then there isn't a deal anymore, and he's, he has his right, as any developer and property owner has, to develop the property as he sees fit. More comments from the public? Sure. Step up, please. Lynn Langton, I live on 10 Surrey Drive. I've lived there for 20 years. Um, this may be a zoning question. Um, I, we live across from the airport, and I, don't, I remember a Cessna going down across the street on 125, and I also have a visual of a plane in Methuen in the apartment buildings. Um, <laughs> Is there some sort of height restrictions of buildings being close to the airport? Has anybody looked into that? Well, the FAA has to uh, approve something like this where it potentially can have a problem with sight lines. Did, didn't we have a very unusual problem with the Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, right, uh, and if this there? is yeah. four stories and the Dunkin' Donuts is only two. But it may have more to do with uh, flight paths flight and path. so forth. Okay. Yeah. So, so we would reach out to them during site plan review and ask them to comment on this. Um, and we did that for the Dunkin' Donuts. The Princeton property um, development has been permitted with the Fajetta Farm um, property is. And same process. We, we involve them, the airport manager. Um, he provides written comment. And if there's any permitting necessary, it's conditioned in a, in a decision for the site plan review. OK. And um, I do obviously have concerns about the traffic. It's really hard now getting out on Surrey onto Sutton to make a left-hand turn from our neighborhood. And during peak times, cars are backing up from the light on 125 by the China Blossom, and cars are starting to go through our neighborhood now. So, and this would only increase that. And there's a lot of little kids in our neighborhood, so just something to keep in mind. I mean, one of the things that we do as a part of, we, we've, you've heard people talking a lot about site plan review, is that we do a fairly elaborate traffic study and we can address, you know, reasonable contingencies and it's done in a very scientific manner, so. Uh, uh, nobody likes traffic, but you, there's things you can do to mitigate it. Okay. It's a requirement with the filing, and the town actually engages with a peer review to, to have our consultants review their submittals as well. Uh, Cheryl Duffy, 59 Surrey Drive. Timeline. Do we have a timeline on when this is happening? So uh, right now, the zoning change is, is through is the, are you asking about the zoning change or actually construction of buildings or both? The construction of the building. I need to oh. know when I'm moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> do we have... I think, I think that's... Uh, um, and we want you to say. No, we, <laughs> um, we want you to say. We're putting a four-story building in my backyard. Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I, I think... Yeah. Um, as it relates to construction, I expect the senior center before the rest of the development. Uh, my expectation would be that if zoning uh, was approved at town meeting, we'd begin with design work in the late fall, uh, which is a, we have to hire what's called an OPM, or an owner's project manager, we'd do that first, because it's a project over $1.5 million. Then we'd proceed with design. I would expect, uh, these are really rough timelines, design to be complete and likely bid uh, late fall of the summer with construction in the fall of 19. Uh, subject to change could be a little shorter than that. It wouldn't be any longer than that. So that's for the senior center, yep. fall 19, and then residential building after I, that? Generally speaking, I think a little after that. Yeah, shortly thereafter. Yeah. 
some site work and things like that at the same time. Yep. I think if we got later into the fall or early into the winter, then I think the residential will be right behind us, if not on the same path. We may, we're likely to be several months ahead of them, so we could be a little bit faster than that, but somewhere in that ballpark. Yep. And that's a, that structure is 10 to 12 months of construction. The senior center? Yep. Okay. Based on our experience with the fire station. All right, any, any other public comments? Sir, when you come on up. Hi, my name is Brandon James um, with Rachel Scarry. Just recently bought 19 Surrey Drive. I'm also a police officer in town. So first question is Mr. Minicucci. He keeps mentioning being a possible 55 over building. Is that going to be a limit? Because I know you're hoping an influx from the senior center. Would there be like a limit on the sales on the, that? Or are you just hoping it would be a 55 over? Uh, there's no limit on the need restriction. Okay. Uh, we're hoping it is not for sale. They're going to be ready. Okay. And right. if you could, if you, if you have a couple of questions, why don't you get them all out and then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll go respond. Well, that way it's not back and forth. It's just easier. Yeah, I mean, my only other major concern is the four-story building that people are going to be looking out their windows down into our houses. And, I mean, just recently moved in, grew up born and raised in town. Um, it's a close-knit community, and those trees are a big part of that. It just keeps us quiet. It keeps a quiet privacy. We all get together, whether it's neighborhood cookouts, whatever it is, and now you're going to have people just staring down. And obviously with us, we're going to have parking directly up against our fence, I mean, as they're proposed now. So just those minor concerns that I have right now. But, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Any Anything else from? Okay. Um, all right. So, anybody have any comments, thoughts? Gene, do you, would I guess I guess I'd take. Um, do we want to? I think there are a lot of people here for this. Do we want to? Is this something we should? Well, actually, sorry. That let's go back to the uh, the B twos. Okay. So um, there are two basic suggested changes here right one is to make these lots into b2 and the other is to change um article 20 7.4 building heights number six to get rid of the phrase collectively compromising at least five acres um so mr kafour why don't you just give us another little recap of that and then if we could put up the other b2 so we could discuss the need for it in this and then other potential consequences. Is that the bypass gene? Yes. <coughs> okay, uh, you'll notice at the bypass uh, route 125 and 114, it's a B2 parcel. That's the, it's about 2.66 acres, that's the right aid. Um, you can also uh, notice that it abuts a B4 district with a height is 60 feet. So right next to it, you could have a uh, structure of 60 feet. So that's the Chestnut Green Office Park. It's right behind. So that's currently the Office Park. Okay. So we don't see. And again, this would only. We're only. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just. I mean, with Chestnut Green is a good example of why we should have site plan review because that's got the worst parking problem <laughs> in the universe. So. Uh, so I guess so. If we went with the change suggested here, that B2 where the right aid is, if they wanted to, and I no indication only, that they do. Only if they go to a residential use. Right, but if right. they went to a residential, yes. they knocked it down, they could go to a, a five story or Subject four story. To site, right, if you residential residential use. Right. Four, story. four story residential use. 55 feet. And right now, it, what can it be right? Right now, it can't be because it can't have the waiver, is that right? What can it be right now? What could they do right now on, on that B2? 35. 35 feet in B2? So that's not much. So you're right. So it, because it's commercial, but if they were to tear it down and go residential, they would fall under the zoning change. Right. From, from up the family. So, but, but, but it's right, which requires a waiver, but they couldn't get a waiver right now. They could not get a waiver right now because it, it's not a five acre lot. Uh, I guess uh, so. To not try not to try to confuse it too much. If they wanted to build a multi-family residential right now, could they? And what height? 
they could, but not they could only at to 35, 35 feet. feet. Okay, and if we change this, they could build it at 40 feet? If it was to change, the, their max height would be 55, but not to exceed four stories. Okay. So right. they could have a pitched roof, essentially. Okay, that, just trying to figure out the difference. Okay, all right. Two parcels, right. so we'll just walk through. Um, Which one are you going to? <coughs> so this, the, the largest one here is Fajetta Development. Fajetta. So that's already been permitted. That's the Princeton property commercial mixed use development. And how large is that? Jim? It, it's in total just under 14 acres, but once it gets developed, one the residential piece will be just over nine, and the commercial is just over four. So that there's an A and R already approved for that. So, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're only concerned right now, the amendment that's being proposed only impacts B2 parcels that are less than five acres, right? Correct. Right. And so when this went in a couple years ago, um, Princeton Property actually brought it forward to the board to sponsor. Um, there was this property that you see on the screen now, as well as one at the end of Sutton Street, 200 Sutton Street, that were at the time both larger than five acres. <coughs> the others were under it. So that language really took advantage of the topography of this lot, and there was a lot of reasoning as to why it would be five acres or more. However, I think what Eric is trying to walk you through is you got to evaluate now the impact it would have or not have on the existing B2 lots. So on this particular map, are we looking at the two smaller B2s that are up at the top? Is that? Right now, I'm just focusing on this very large one here. Yeah. I'm going to walk through And then walk one down the okay. others. Okay, so that's where Pajetta Farm had been, and it's okay. been permitted, just not constructed at this time. And that's going to become a nine and a four plus? I'm sorry? That's going to become a nine and a four plus? Yes. Okay. The, the four plus is commercial, the nine is the residential piece sitting to the rear of that lot. So then as you walk towards, um, back towards the China Blossom on Osgood Street? You'll see, um, there's a little B2 that appears to be Perfectos. I don't know how that happened. You have a slice of the Butcher Point Plaza at B2. Um, and the rest is general business. I don't know if you can see it there. Right, where the She's cursor moving is. the cursor a little bit. Okay. Um, exactly. Don't I don't know how that happened. I didn't have time uh, to look at that George, today. We drew a district right through a building. Um, <laughs> If they you may have to do with that when the butcher boy property was assembled. Maybe there was a mistake. I don't know. And maybe there's a map. Uh, or Eric mentioned it to me today. I just I looked at the map. It's on the map, map itself. So it's online. So, it. um, if you keep going down the uh, across the road, the next one is uh, Casablanca. I would say that's an extremely limited site, and the chance of putting any residential development on that site. Um, is pretty slim when you take all the wetland issues in. I also would suggest it's probably, since it's a butts airport, far more impacted by the import, airport. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. I didn't get the uh, size of that. Okay. But there's a lot of wetland. You can see the water going right yeah. through it. Um, going further down, uh, you have the Dunkin' Donuts, the giant glass site, um, also with the Plaza Decor. Uh, I'm going to talk about those. And across the street, it's the one where Gianna Interior is at. I believe that's called um, Osgood Plaza. Is that one Osgood Plaza? So it's not the Mad Maggie's or the white paint one. It okay. is the barn and with the, the building off. Now, What's interesting about all those is you will notice if you look up, you'll see red lights on poles. That's the flight path coming in. Um, so those would definitely be restricted like Dunkin' Donuts <coughs> in terms of height. So I, I don't anticipate, and I can get confirmation well, with the airport. I mean, the, the one where the, uh, where the gas station and the Dunkin' Donuts is, that's I believe there's development proposals afoot for those properties. So the, um, I'm sorry, you're right. The one on the end is the mobile gas station. That's the end, the tip of it. And then you get to uh, Sutton Street. Um, that was just 
the Shell, Shell station, Shell right? Station. It was purchased yeah. and now under new management for mobile. Um, the proposal we had heard is that the structures would remain, but they're just finding uses for where Holland Flower was and where the old Dunkin' Donuts was. But I don't think they were talking about any uh, building changes. There was a proposal before um, for a different owner, a gas station, and it would have been a different structure, but that, that fell through. Oh, it did, okay. Yeah. I think that purchase was quite recent. Correct. The, the mobile conversion, yes. Yeah. So they're, they're maintaining the garage repair area and the mobile gas station instead of Shell now. Is this the uh, Sutton Street? 200 Sutton Street, yes. So this is um, uh, 200 and 220 Sutton Street. It's actually two parcels. Uh, one's five and a half acres, four and a half acres, one's a little over two, so it's like 6.6 .6 acres. This is the one, if you combine the two parcels, they are under, uh, I think, the same ownership. Um, that one already has the potential, so the change we're proposing doesn't affect that parcel in any way. That parcel already has this benefit of what's in the bylaw. Parcels. I guess the, the concern I have is the unintended consequences. It all makes sense when you talk about it now, but if you take this out, you know, say you take out this whole five acres, and then one of those, like the last one, Sun Street, one gets sold off and one stays, then then they're, I mean, they're, we don't know what would happen. Yep, correct. So, because this is more than what you need necessarily for this project, right? I mean, this could go from five to four, and this particular project would be. Could, yeah, we have to be. Right, you're over I'd four acres, right? Um, three, yeah, it's a little under four, I think. And then if you take the what's coming off, I don't know how you guys would look at that uh, for the senior center or, or did you look at it totality. But um, uh, I will say also that in that, that's the uh, uh, property, there is uh, a bunch of buildings, right? One of which was a mill that. It's currently two stories, used to be historically four stories. Um, I think it's an area that's not impacted by a structure going up to potentially four stories. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I think in terms of downtown development, you might in some ways encourage some of that. And this would, it would still require, for anything, getting a waiver would require a special permit? Yes. Correct. And I think the last one is, uh, this is right on Sharpness Pond and 114, 2302 Turnpike. This is one where the new um, landscaping company has just yeah. built. Yeah. I would also point out that it is surrounded by um, I-1 district, which has a height requirement of 55 feet. Uh, I would also say the one on Sutton Street is surrounded by the IS district. <coughs> has a height for, uh, of 55 feet as well. So the parcels around that one, the two we were just talking about, um, the other parcels around it can go up to 55 as well. Um, and same thing on this one. Uh, but that one's just been developed. And I don't think they've opened yet. No, they have not. Right. They're still constructed. And that, again, that's uh, out on um, an area that would not impact any kind of uh, residential district. And that's it for B2 process. Does anyone from the public have any comments on the B2 discussion? That was invigorating. All right. Um, so I guess I. <laughs> okay. Some board. About the five acre piece? Yes, please. So when, when the board um, was uh, considering the Forget a Farm development, and the height waiver, my, my sense, I can't speak for the whole board, but my sense was that limiting that to five acres or more brought some certainty to um, what might this height waiver mean for the town? Because we could see, oh, it's only these two parcels, the parcel off 125 and the parcel off Sutton Street. And I think that was a, a, a not insignificant reassurance to the board that by taking this step 
um, we had some sense of what the consequences would be for the town to remove the five acre. If that five acre wasn't there, I, I don't, I don't know that I would have been for it, and I don't know that the board would have been. And so it it does trouble me a little bit to sort of do this kind of sequentially, um, just kind of a slippery slope kind of thing. It it concerns me a little bit, and I. I appreciate your earlier question of, you know, why not, you know, something other than just deleting the five acres. Well, that's For example, more than four. Right, and and that's that's my con my more, other concern. More because, than four and a half, because if my right. math is right, I think this is four point five six. Well, that's what I thought. I thought it was four point <laughs> five, and that, but but we're here in three point nine. I thought it was closer to four and a half. Well, this came up at the uh, last planning board meeting. And I forget who it was, Gene, but I asked the question and I think you were adding the residential right, lot right. to the two Knights of Columbus lots. The last time I wasn't. And when I did, that's when I understood. So my understanding is that the the two Knights of Columbus is one point five one plus two point four seven. And then the one residential lot I think is 0.58 and that comes up I think to 4.56 so why why couldn't it be four and a half or four I, I, but, but but I'm yeah. asking literally are we missing something would, would the senior the senior, be on a if, the senior if, if the senior center is going to be carved out as a separate possible Ah, that would not count in the total. Well, that's, I, I don't know. I, 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 I would see. say no. Well, right. but if, what? well, that's going to eventually. That's going to be donated to the town, so it'll be a parcel oh, separate. But it'll be one. But it'll be one zoning district. Is it, that's the question, right? I mean, if we're zoning it together, is it going to be? This says a parcel of parcels of land, so it could be more than one parcel located within a business B two zoning district. So if it's within one zoning district, I, I think it can be together if they're separate zoning districts. Right, the, way, but, the way I'm reading it. But I'm combining a parcel, uh, and not only that, taking a portion. So you're taking 25,000 square feet, roughly, um, which is the where the senior center itself would go. Let's say you're taking another 25,000, roughly. <coughs> so it's, it's going to be over an acre, potentially, for those 80 spaces and the, um, and the senior center. So if you're doing that, you're down to potentially under three and a half acres, and it's and and I'm not combining parcels for residential development. In so a way, I'm, I am combining two of two parcels. If we had a list of all the B two properties you just showed us, yep. except for the two that are over five acres, because that's not part of the issue here. Mm -hmm. If we had a list of all the other B twos, what are the size of those other B twos? Because what I'm looking for is. Is there is there a threshold number there where, you know, most of them are less than two or yep. most are less than three? What, what what what's the table of those sizes? I could provide that for you. I would say that um, without potentially the one on uh, where the gas station is and where Giant Glass is and where Dunkin' Donut is, someone could possibly uh, combine those parcels, rip them down, and put housing. Uh, what I was trying to suggest was. That's in the flight path. Right, and it just is. Just not going to get it. Right. So when I started looking at all the the parcels, I just didn't see, quite honestly. Uh, yeah. And I appreciate what what the board's talking about. I didn't see it as being a as real a, uh, a risk. But those are also um, current right. parcels. I mean, something else. We have other zone people looking for zoning changes. Something else could change to be two yep. in the right. future. Would, which, yeah. So right. then the we don't have to vote on that. Right, but then we don't have that. Yeah, then we have no limit at all. And right. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Peter is that, I mean, even going through this, I get to well, especially with the one, um, you know, where uh, the, the drugstore is. That's, that one in and of itself scares me to death. Okay. Um, I mean, that's and, a very different site. It's yeah. Merrimack College. It's just, yeah. it's a very What's different. Can we get the size of that, the right site? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 2.66. Yeah. Sure the size so, just as far if I can. Yeah. Um, the question would be, uh, ultimately, it's where the board wants to go with this. And so, the, the question just would be a function of the relationship. So, the assumed relationship right now is that Tom would be gifted the property for the parking and the building, right? The question is, you know, is through this process, the public process, if there's a decision by the planning board that there's a minimum 
um, acreage, which it makes the board feel better about the collateral impact of making a change like this, or quite frankly, an alternative to what's been proposed, then would work within that framework. I mean, maybe it's, uh, I'm, I'm talking out loud and I shouldn't really do that. Maybe it's, you know, but I do it anyway. Uh, maybe it's a 99 year lease. Um, and other alternatives. So, so um, I think the point is, the question really is, is the planning board supportive of the concept and within what parameters, and then we will need to decide if that still fits within the concept of being able to have a business deal that does that or not. Uh, you know, I, I certainly it's not our expectation that the planning board is going to put themselves in a position, and we're not asking that. Um, to be uncomfortable about the collateral impact of any zoning change. That's not our goal, it's not our interest in this neighborhood or anywhere else in town. Um, we do think this is a good project compared to what could be there, and I think I keep on repeating that, but if there are some limits, we'll work within those limits. I think it was your question that uh, parcel by Merrimack is 2.66. Correct. Yep. So, I mean, I think there are ways to, it feels to me four acres is the right Thing if we were to do something. I mean, we obviously still have a little bit of time, but. Uh, I, would, I would say as a right. preference, yeah. I mean, if you're parsing sort of parts of acres, uh, fee simple ownership from any town's perspective is a lot better than uh, ground leases, right? Gets a little complicated for us. So, as you, maybe as Mr. Kafori provides, what you've asked for, the sort of inventory and its impact. Um, um, if you get to the point that you're nuancing that a little bit, I, I certainly would tell you that, that fee simple ownership is, uh, for you folks as private citizens and for us as a, as a corporate entity in the town, fee simple ownership is our preference. And so, but, but it will provide you that list of each parcel that's impacted and you can make decisions that you think are appropriate. And maybe we could get some more information, maybe either from town council or Gene, just your thoughts. It seems to me if it's one zoning district that, that multiple parcels, regardless of ownership, as could long be, as there be two parcels, it does seem to me. So I, I think they could be counted together sure. whether, yeah. I, I'm not town council, you should talk with her, but it seems to me reading this that if they're within the same zoning district, then you, it doesn't say anything about ownership. And they, uh, and they were approved uh, together. prior to uh, this, because right. remember what gets, yeah, and I, exactly, I think, because if you take, well, on the other one, the Frigetta property, it's no surprise that they're the resulting parcels over nine acres, right? So. And, and the yeah. 200 Sutton Street, one is 4.5 and the other is 2.0 something, so comprised together, they were going to be over the five. Right. So, yeah. so I think you're right, and we will yeah, confirm so with town well, council. Yeah, we should confirm that. Yeah. yeah, we may, it may be easy to do it, and we won't want to foul that, you know. Right. Those are in the same ownership, but regardless, I think yeah. the fact that you can count them both together is how it was yeah. written. So, okay. all right, right. So, if we if these two were counted together and they equal 4.5, a potential change to four would potentially allow that to go forward and not really have much impact on our current P2s if right. we could get that list. That's just where my head's at. Okay. Um, so, Gene, what should we? do on on this in terms of next steps are there any do we need come back we come back for the next meeting or is there something you need us to do for publication so <coughs> similar to how we handled the special town meeting we can go to legal notice um just describing the article it won't be in detail we can have that available on the 20th which is the next day you meet and we can come back with a revised proposal um, so the legal notice just says you can look at the materials today in both the clerk's office and the planning department. Well, in this case, this would be a planning board, two planning board sponsored yep. articles, right? Right. right. So well, if, if we sort of, if we think there's a consensus favorably to stand behind them, we should put them up. We should put both of them up. But yep. at least that's what I'm reading. I think people have issues with you know some of the details but i think the the basic notion of supporting two articles is is there does it seem does anyone does anyone have any contravening right. thoughts so by including them in the legal notice it will allow you to have those three public hearings yeah. if, if you wait another meeting then potentially you would only have two so, so yeah. okay, i so think I, it's important I, to have I, three i i agree with john i think there's consensus that that at least from my perspective i, I really when mr Miller kind of hammered home is that there's another potential project out there 
that we really have a lot less say over, which would be 160 units. Um, this project seems a lot more refined than that one, more limited in scope uh, and density, and I think we have a little more control. So I think I think we'd be supportive of getting that into the legal notice and then finally crafting what we need to do here to finish it up. Right, and we'll have time to submit the, the um, crafted warrant article for the warrant itself. Okay. We'll have time to submit it. So then why don't we um, continue then the, continue the discu this discussion for the next meeting? Right. Yeah. Uh, which will be March 20th? March 20th. Okay. So we'll continue the discussion on the what's been 505 Sutton Street till the March 20th meeting. Okay. okay. All right, so we're going to go back to the top of our list to Kelsey Lane. So Kelsey Lane, um, at the last meeting, we discussed some errors were in the original Form I covenant, the Form M utilities and conveyance easements, and a driveway easement. Those have all been resolved. You allowed me to discuss with the <coughs> council, have the errors corrected and re-recorded. Those were done. The developer has also posted the performance bond for the construction of the driveway access to the subdivision. Um, I ran it by DPW. They were in agreement that the decision for the subdivision actually specified $4,000 for that. And I, again, confirmed that with DPW, given that it's been quite some time since that decision was written. He was comfortable with the 4000 That has been posted by the applicant. And um, Attorney Brian Vaughn is here today to request release of those lots from the covenant so that they could be sold um, through a Form J process. Okay, and do you have any uh, concerns? No, I don't. I, like I said, I reviewed each of those documents with town council. Um, she approved the changes. They have been recorded at this point, and the Form J has been submitted in tonight's package with an engineer certification. Um, on. I really just, I'm hoping I don't have to say anything. Um, okay, so we'll stop you there. <laughs> <laughs> any, in case there are any questions. Any questions, comments? So uh, the, the motion would be to release the lots, uh, presuming the Form J is in good order, right? Yes, I mean, and I, allow the planner to sign on the board's behalf. Yeah, okay. So, so I, want to make I that would motion? make a motion to that effect. So it's yeah. releasing lots two and three yes. from the covenant <coughs> and release. Um, and allow the planner to sign the Form J covenant. Yeah. Okay. So motion, second. seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> I hope you don't charge by the word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get the jet ski. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along. What I'd like to do next is the 127 Marblehead, if the board doesn't mind. I think that is fairly straightforward. Um, Okay. Gene one. Fay is the property owner. This one, if you recall, is at the corner of Middlesex Street. It is zoned general business. He would like to um, develop the vacant building from the commercial use that it was back in the 80s, I believe, um, to an all residential unit. Understanding that there may be some additional permitting with the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, I think his eyes are open to that. His attorney that represented him at the last hearing actually sat on our ZBA for 12 years, I believe. Um, so I think his eyes are wide open to that, and I don't know if there's any more information you can share since that meeting. Can I'll you, be quiet as well. Can you uh, just, there may be people here that weren't here last time, can yes. you just give us a um, summary of uh, what the what you're looking for in terms of zoning and what you're looking to do in terms of a project. Yeah, so uh, currently it's uh, two apartments, two two-bedroom apartments, and then a general uh, then it's a, a, a business that was a convenience store, hardware store, candy store, and a whole bunch of other things all in one unit. Uh, the store has been vacant for at least 30 years. Um, okay. Yeah, all right. So it's 25, uh, a long time. Uh, so uh, the, the goal would be to turn it into all residential. Uh, it, it, I have plans for four apartments, but open to working with the planning board on what the final result is. The request for zoning change is to um, change it to an R4. Is that right? 
Yes. Um, R4. To zone the parcel to be included within the R4 zoning district as most particularly shown on this map right here. Um, and what surrounds that? In terms of zoning district? Yes. That, that's a good point. I did think that we could replace this map showing the zoning as opposed to just the parcel location. Looking at where my cursor is, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was casting this. <laughs> We're still looking at building heights. Um, so the building immediately adjacent to this parcel is zone general business as well, as well as a parcel up Middlesex Street, I think approximately where my cursor is now. Yeah. So in this zoning district, there's just some spot zoning for general business that existed at the time, I think, when zoning went in in this area. So they've remained general business. Um, what is everything else? R4. R4, everything okay. Else is R4. I think within this screenshot, you would see this, the one right next to it, and the one up Marblehead as all general business lots. And like, like I said, if you prefer me include that as the map, I can switch that out easily. I think something showing what um, what the surrounding neighborhood is would be would definitely and be helpful. In terms of zoning. In terms of zoning. Yep. It seems like this is more consistent with the current neighborhood than, yep. than a general business. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's at one level, converting it to R4 is is almost like a no-brainer, it's a chip shot. The, really, all the risk is with you that you got to be able to get the ZBA to do what you want to go because by right you're only allowed one you now and so that uh, and one you, you might be allowed two there's two apartments in there now there are two apartments in there now yeah, yeah. so true. that's that's all you would be able to get yeah. as of right yeah to get to five you would have to go to that yeah, yeah. Okay. any questions? questions anyone from the public no so okay the, the board is comfortable sponsoring the article any okay. opposition to sponsoring the article? I think it's think fine. Comfortable? Okay, fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think probably the majority of people are here for 800 MSF. Is that 142 green? Okay, so that's outside of the zoning articles. Right. Um, okay, so 800 MSF, are you comfortable taking that? Sure. So this um, was brought to you. I don't think it's officially been submitted yet That's as correct. a citizen petition. However, um, it's been proposed as a citizen petition to rezone the parcel at 800 Mass Ave, which is also, if I remember correct, 153, 153 Academy, Academy Road. Road. So there's two structures, the Historical Society's headquarters slash museum building, as well as the former textile museum, which has been vacant for some time. So both structures exist on one lot. Um, there's been some correspondence in your packet. The proposal is to zone from R3 to a B1 lot. Mm. Um, so have you had any updates since the last meeting? Uh, I, I, we wanted to take this opportunity to see if you all had any feedback as the result of your site visit. Anything that you would want to share with us about what you saw and what you learned and anything that would help us in our endeavor here anybody about that and I know we also did receive uh, correspondence um, regarding uh, this from the Center Realty Trust which I actually thought was um, made some good points so uh, mm -hmm. have you had a chance to read that maybe we have not we okay I'm seeing a shaking head no and a shaking head yes I, see it all. I have not seen it okay um, so I mean it well I think it, it is some. They, they. Is anyone here to speak on that? Yes. Okay. So, why don't we? Um, why don't we do this, Mr. Why don't we have Mr. Osgood speak about about your letter? That way, you guys could hear that as well. Because sure. it's there's some worthwhile points that I think to discuss. Hi, my name is Ben Osgood. I live at 69 Old Village Lane. Um, I'm one of the trustees with Center Realty. There were three trustees, Charlie Salisbury and Don Elliott and myself. Um, strangely enough, Center Realty Trust has one stockholder, and that's the Historical Society. Um, but the trustees, Center Realty was formed in 1959, 
when there was an awful lot of activity in the old center. That's when the textile museum got built right along that time. Um, and there were a lot of other things that took place. Our position on this is essentially that we're sympathetic to the textile building being used. Um, it's a, it's a <coughs> sort of an iconic building, become an iconic building to the old center. The problem is we don't have enough time. I only learned about it uh, a week ago. Actually, Tom Zarico told me about it. And uh, Charlie Salisbury's out of town, as is Don Elliott. We would like to see the board deny this application at the present time, but work towards coming up with some kind of a use where these buildings that go way back, uh, that there, are, there are four buildings. They own the two that, that's on the table under discussion. There is, and in their application, they say that the Masonic Lodge is zone B1. We don't believe that it is. Zone, the uh, Masonic Lodge is zoned R3, in our opinion, just like the way they are zoned now. The other building is the Grange, which we own. And these buildings um, all need to be dealt with so that there isn't a risk where the buildings, if they ever changed hands in some way, uh, I mean, these nonprofits, Center Realty is a nonprofit, the Historical Society is a nonprofit, they're, having, they're struggling to always have enough money to, to survive and, and conduct their, the jobs that they have. And, you know, nobody ever thought that the Textile Museum which was very well funded, far better than the Historical Society, far better than Santa Realty Trust. Nobody ever thought they were going to go broke. They're gone. They, just, they took the whole thing and it's gone, the collection, everything. Well, that could happen. It may not happen tomorrow, but it could happen in you know, 20 years, 30 years. And it's taken the, the, the old center has been under workmanship for over a hundred years. That's when they started when, with the common to be built. Um, you had the um, um, the other organization, uh, the village. Um, what, what is that? The Improvement village Improvement Society was one of the first ones. Um, Center Realty Trust. Uh, all of these entities worked over the years to make that old center as pretty as they could, and it hasn't changed. There have been very few buildings built in there. We own, we are in a butter to, to their property on all sides. We have three vacant lots on Academy Road. Um, we have one on Osgood Street. We have one on Andover Street. Um, we have buildings, uh, the Hayskills Exchange Building. The Grange building, as I mentioned, we have uh, two duplexes and we have one fourplex. We've sold off the single family units that we owned. One was 26 Andover Street um, and 10 Salem Street, the little uh, cape, little yellow cape. Um, so, what we're asking, our objection to this zoning is that there isn't enough time to deal with the issue properly. Can you talk um, about a little bit, you, in your letter, you said that in the, in the zoning here that you think that there could be um, a way for them to do the office space that they're talking about through the zoning, uh, where it says all other buildings and uses are hereby expressly prohibited, except uses which are similar in character to the permitted uses shall be treated as requiring a special permit. What, what did you mean? Could you well, explain what you meant by that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there has to be a way to use a build, like the, t the textile building. Uh, there has to be a way to use that building without tearing it down and starting over, as Tom Zarico said, build a house there. Th there needs to be, and I, I think there is, woven into the, the zoning bylaw, provisions that let the Board of Appeals and the Planning Board, everybody working in the, in the same direction, to solve this problem. 
you just don't say, well, gee, because you're not a museum. I mean, there aren't many museums around. And, you know, for them to sit and wait till some other museum comes along and says, well, we want to rent the building and we'll fix it, th that's not going to happen. And we simply, and I don't think the town wants to see a change of that, that property. I think it could be used as an office. Um, and it really, it really was an office. If, if any of Can you, you ha have been in it, you know, when it was running, uh, you had down in the basement, you had the document center, which is now over in Andover. Well, the document center really wasn't an office. It wasn't a museum. They dealt with, uh, you know, documents that needed restoration. The Magna Carta, the the uh, constitutions that, that that are still in intact, they they're the people that they go to with these priceless objects, and they were over in that that building at at one time. There was a, a large component was the, um, the the library and the the it was really more research than it was going and look at things. I mean, on occasion, they'd have a visitor, but really. So you don't seem to have a problem with what they want to do in terms of the professional offices and things like that. It's the zoning change. That it's the zoning change okay. that's a problem, because the zoning change yeah. allows all kinds of things. And w we just don't think a proliferation within the old center is a logical way to go uh, with that zoning change. Because as I say, the Masonic Lodge, they're hanging on by their fingers. Uh, that that property will probably, I at some point in time, become available for some other use. We don't want to see it used as B1. The Grange, we have to find a, a use for the Grange. It's, it had a, till we tour the bathrooms out, we're doing some remodeling in there, um, but it had a occupancy permit of 300 people. Uh, that's a lot of people in an old wood frame building that's almost 100 years old. Um, so. There needs to be put together a working group, planning board, textile museum, center realty trust, other people, uh, to, to model something that could be used. Come back in in six months, maybe there'll be a special town meeting, or at the longest uh, next year. Well, do you guys have any, not to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot. Let me just say a couple of things in response uh, to Mr. Osgood. Um, I, first is, you know, we certainly want to do something worthwhile with the building. We want to keep the building the way it is. We love the building. We want to retain the building. So that's not a question in our mind. It's not tearing down the building. That's not our plan. Secondly, we've looked at all the possible uses we could make of that building, certainly under the current zoning. And as an example, when the textile, when the, uh, the the current textile museum in Lowell was closing, they came back to us and said, you know, any possibility we could move back into our building. And among other things, there were problems about the space, but they had no money, right? Certainly no money to, to pay the rent and absolutely no money to fix up the building. So as Mr. Osgood points out, <coughs> another museum, but a non-starter for us. So that is an example of how the, that one particular aspect of R3 seems to be hard for us to utilize in a reasonable fashion. Um, trying to find a beneficial use for the building in its, in, in, and keep the look of the building while at the same time renovating the building and then providing some income for the society, which as I, you know, I would remind you were privately funded um, led us to be one, to put some business uh, use of the building um, for our benefit. And that would be similar to what's being done in the center, as, as Mr. Osgood is aware, like in the Hayscales Exchange and the Brick Store Building. You know, similar uses to what those buildings are today. So that was our thought. Um, as far as a group to think of uses, I'm not, I'm just, I'd have I, to think, think more about that. Th at least in my mind, the, the, the question 
the, the interesting one of the interesting questions raised by this, and I know our building inspector weighed in and kind of said he didn't think that it was um, um, a, that it could be done. I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. It, is whether or not it, what you want to do could be done under the current zoning, if you know. And I don't know if anyone had any thoughts about that, but it. If, if the uses are similar to what is allowed in the current zoning, then this says it could potentially be done by a special permit. You, the building inspector disagrees with that, at least in terms of this, but CBA might have a different opinion. And but frankly, you, that may be a I, I, better I mean, way. There's, uh, there's other permutations is that perhaps we could modify the R4 zoning to allow the, that sort of use by special permit, um, you know, again, I'm thinking out loud, I don't know right. exactly what the answer is, as opposed to a, a, a B1, because in my mind, the whole problem with this was you rezone the thing, instead of using the scalpel, you're using like a big hammer. That what you've done is you've now taken the entire historical society partial and made it B1 that allows all the uses in B1 district and so again, 30 years down the road, what if something happened to the other buildings? You could put a commercial building on the whole part of that partial, and there's not a bloody thing the town can do about that, it. That's it. I mean, so I it, can we can we do that? I mean, can we create a new zoning district for this location that adds what they have now plus professional office? Yeah, can I make a, a, a apple something to that before? I mean, John, I think we've met our three. Not our four, first of all. Right. Three, sure. three, three, yeah. Yeah. What, what, I, yeah. I, I think that's what the start that is proposing, a group to look at zoning options, whether it be a new district for this whole old center en encompassing all those parcels that right now are R3 that he has concerned that <coughs> yeah. could also be rezoned, or the um, Masonic Lodge that uh, I agree. I've seen a zoning map with it as R3, and I've seen a zoning map with it, and I questioned Tom when the article was submitted that it wasn't B1. Our zoning map today shows it as B1, and the zoning map is what um, has precedent. Well, originally, so. the way they did the zonings, uh, they did them by meet, meets and bounds. Roughly in 1960, they gave up that, and that's when you just used the maps. And everybody knew because the, the map system they had were a 600 scale map and a 1200 scale map. And uh, <coughs> the 1200 scale map was too big to work with, but it did show the, the, the properties. But the 600 get used and, and they all got mucked together. It uh, takes a lot of research to figure out what these properties are zoned. So I did have a discussion with the building inspector and, and he interprets the bylaw that specific sentence, which is the last one in this indented paragraph, um, he did not believe that what was proposed for professional office type use was similar in character to the museum use. Um, but it's similar in character, isn't it similar in character to what uses are allowed in well, the, the uses, district? The uses allowed today in R3 is right. not, is the museum. And so just he's saying it's not similar to the museum. The office is not similar to the museum. I, again, it just, mm -hmm. I think it needs more conversation with right. them and okay. a better explanation. It's a little bit, and this is why I think it really is a big public policy issue. As part of the, you know, I think, Ben, you, you said it well that it was called a museum, but it was actually more than a museum. But I think what it, the key was that it was sort of a non profit entity set up for the public good in some shape or form. Yeah. I think you cross a big divide when you have something that's a commercial enterprise. And I'm not saying it's necessarily bad, but it's different. I think it is different. And, um, and the other concern yeah. is, I think I raised at the last meeting, what would that do to the museum headquarters? And that's not allowed in B1. And so to rezone that whole parcel, B1, you'd be making that building non-conforming, and he said that wouldn't be allowed either. So. Again, it just leads to, I mean, I guess the parcel could be subdivided, so, leaving one in. I mean, I think, three. I think at least, uh, well, Tom, why don't you go and say. Yeah, I just, I just want to say, first of all, Ben brings up some really good points. I mean, I think yeah. that, that there's a lot of, a lot of ways of, of discussing this, and, and maybe, maybe a, a practical approach is either some other overlay, or maybe it's, it, it's adjusting the R3 uh, 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 allowed uses uh, is, is another alternative. Remember, this, this this uh, this was brought forward because right. of a limited 
range of options. Um, clearly, it, it doesn't it doesn't work uh, as a house or a museum. I think we've discussed that. I think I don't think anybody thinks that a single family home or museum is going to be there. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So it was driven by the uh, an attempt to uh, um, avail the building of right. the least impactful business alternative that's that's allowed. <laughs> And that was the driving force. If there's a better way, I don't think anybody here is so is, that, a, is opposed to that. I think you know, and, and maybe it does require some more some more debate. I think that's what it is. I think uh, the sense I get of the board is that we're we're also sympathetic to the to the cause and that the ideas make sense. But going to a B one is maybe too uh, general a change. And I think maybe going back and trying to figure out something more really specific and I know it's hard without a particular tenant but I from going through the, there with you guys and mm -hmm. seeing the building I do think you're somewhat limited in the types of tenants and I think you have a good sense of who you're looking for and what you're looking for but if you could come back with something or either whether it's going through the building commissioner and the ZBA whether it's working with planning to try to find something that may not need a zoning change or coming back with a really particular zoning change whether it's you know, incorporating just a couple of items um, and not including a lot of things. I, I think some fine tuning could could get you there. I, I don't know when, schedule wise, but I don't think it's ready at least as a, a B one for the board to support. I think we can support something at some point that gets a little more fine tuned. And how do how do you all feel about the the prospect of, of taking a look at you know the, the the broader issue in that in that area? I mean, is that um, yeah. 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 I guess that's very consistent with what we're doing overall anyway with the master plan and sort of thinking big about what the town looks like and this seems to be just a small piece of that. It seems like a good time while everybody's focused on that to, to do that. <coughs> and including someone from the historical commission and <coughs> get the right people at the table and I think a creative approach can address the, the other possibles as well. Um, Are you amenable to a, uh, uh, a longer uh, timeline? Uh, time, time, uh, more time is always more challenging. But I think even even when Kathy Stevens spoke uh, last last week, I mean, again, what what we want to do is is uh, uh, is something that works for everybody, uh, something that makes sense. Um, I think everybody has the same goal. Uh, when we whenever we've discussed this, uh, everybody wants to keep the integrity, the aesthetics. Um, everybody wants to make sure that we have viable uh, organizations uh, taking care of the old center um, I think we have all the same goals so and I, I just want to be clear mr. Simons you know we're still thinking about commercial clients I mean ultimately because we don't see nonprofits as ever having the resources to help us do what we need to do in that building so that's still no, 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 I, agree with you. I, I just uh, wanted uh, to make sure I, I I don't have a problem with it is I just think it's it, it's a little bit different I mean um, but I think you know one of the things is I've, I've talked to a lot of people about this since we met a few weeks ago and I think everyone similar to the discussion here tonight really has an affinity for that building and wants to preserve that building so i feel like we're all on the same page it's just a question of how they get there from here could, could i ask a question yeah. i mean if, if we can get some some valuable feedback i guess uh is it um uh, is it the appearance of the building which i know everybody nobody doesn't like it but what's the bigger the bigger concerns that you have and that you've heard is it the, the appearance of the building or, or the the specific use. I mean, is one of those a more dominant concern? Well, I don't. The, the appearance of the building. I think, I think it's both. I think it's that to find some, like the printing museum and the appearance of the building, they work, right? They work together. Like you have a, a, a museum that's do, devoted to a historical industry in New England, right? So those two things work together. So I think it's keeping the, 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 the use somehow related to whether it's architecture, art, or history, or something um, cultural, you know, and, and then in conjunction with not putting up, you know, just a you know cookie cutter building, you know, trying to keep that the the way the old center looks in that same vein. I mean, that's that's kind of what I've heard and kind of how I see it. 
And I know that, that's kind of what you were, you, you were, Peter's thoughts were talking about, you know, what kind of uses could you have there? And I think those kind of things, you know, if, if there was a, a environmental or something artistic or something like that, whether commercial or not, you know, if it's nonprofit, great, but if it's commercial, but something where you, people are working there and being inspired by the area and people can walk by and be inspired by the building, it's something symbiotic. And we, you know, as Mr. Osgood points out, we both of our organizations are challenged to uh, do things with our buildings. You know, they have to make investments in their buildings, like the Grange. I mean, that's not free. They have to upgrade that building, do something with it to make it viable for their purposes, just like we do. So we've tried to, you know, as you can imagine, sitting around, we can think of any extremely exotic and enjoyable things that could be done with the building. I mean, it could be all kinds of wonderful things that are fairly theoretical, and we can't imagine how we can now get it down to the practical level where who are we going to find that has the money to fix the building and then rent it from us, right? And that's unfortunately where the, the thinking usually breaks down, is at the pragmatic level. We, like, how do we get them, who do we find that will pay and then rent? You know, so that's where, um, the uses often become much more mundane, right? People that have businesses that have offices or high tech that are making a lot of money, they're building software. So I, I don't know, something, somebody that has some money that would like the building because they, are pas they get passionate about it, they like the location. But a nonprofit typically is not that kind of an organization, unfortunately. I mean, we'd love to have, we would love to have another museum in there. We would love that if they would pay to fix the building up and then pay us some rent for it. That I would mean, be ideal. We wouldn't. Would if, if jump you, at that at, you, know. if you folks can work. I mean, if you, I, I know, if there if you have, if you find interest, and then work with the rest of these folks to to talk about how we could you could tailor that interest into a really kind of specific proposal that uh, limits any changes to you know something kind of that like you're talking about. I think that's probably the way to go. Right. I mean, to the extent that you really to have the extent you can legit group that was serious and had the financial backing to do it, it makes it a little bit easier to frame, you know, the zoning because you can build it I, around I, what the use is. We, we certainly pay. understand that, but as we've spoken about already, there is kind of the chicken-egg problem, I know. That Mr. Simons, as you know. I mean, to get somebody interested, they want to know that it's a good possibility, and right now it seems like sort of a vague possibility. You know, we're quite a ways from have any sort of agreement that, oh yeah, we'll get some kind of a zoning that would allow you to come into the building well, and do something I, with it. So I think you just heard, at least from the consensus of the board, that we're supportive of yeah, I understand. the ideas, and you I can understand. take that to whomever you're talking with, and I think you have the support of the center trust in terms right. of the ideas, and bring on someone from the historical commission, bring in the town in, at least in terms of, you know, talking about what's possible. If you bring all those people and say, hey, these people all support it, I, that, Show us that, some, you know, I, I think that's that I may certainly be the way appreciate you need to that. Go. And I guess what what I would ask you all, since you are the experts, <coughs> I am certainly not, is what do we say about how we address the zoning issue, right? Because R three currently does not support the kinds mm -hmm. of people we're talking about. So I, how do we do that? I, I mean, don't if know. If I came, if I, I wouldn't came, go into I wouldn't go into it saying that. Okay. I don't know that it doesn't. I mean, I mean, I think it could. It could. There, there are ways. I think there's a. Creative. I think you could say there is a commitment on the part of all interested parties to come to a zoning solution that will manage a use that we think is appropriate. I mean, you can't guarantee anything specific, but I think you can say there's not everybody is supportive of the idea, and we'll work the best to to make it happen. I think that's a good result of the dialogue that we've had yeah, so far. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's progress. I mean, it isn't, yeah. it isn't conclusive, yeah. but it is progress, and that's, that's a good, that's a good step. Yeah. Okay. 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 So okay. I think the consensus is we're not going to spot to this now, and we'll just keep working on it and see where things go. I don't think it needs to be on the agenda for unless something else happens, you know, and if you, if you want to come back and put it on the agenda, just right. let you know and we'll go from there. Yeah. So I'd like to ask a question. At this time, so there's nothing to withdraw. It's, right. it was, okay. okay. Is there anything that we should discuss here? Maybe the answer is no, but to follow up on the suggestion, I'm just wondering, is there an <coughs> action to put together the right kind of group to uh, 
further this support. We should start the process. I think we should loop it into the master plan, as you said, because I think it ties into that, and I think there might be some interest. We should probably bring the topic up at the March 15th meeting, yeah. see you? if there's any uh, any interest. I think the broader participation you get in the process, the better off well, you yeah. pay. I, but it, it's, uh, I, I, my, my interpretation of what Mr. Osgood said is almost like a working group. Do you all, all ever participate in working groups as members sure. of the? Yeah. Yeah, we do it all the Planning time. department yeah. does, and you know, because it, 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 it sounded like getting everybody sitting yeah. around a table brainstorming zoning alternatives for the whole area, not just yeah. our parcel. And I, I agree, bring it up at the master plan, but I think establishing this working group and getting I think you get the working group started, right. yeah. started on just yeah. zoning, and, you know. Just yeah. possibilities that could be incorporated so, maybe within the existing bylaw? I think also, by the way, you've got to have the old center um, district commission. District commission. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can, can the planning yeah. department take any role in helping to support the formation of this working group? I, yeah. If you would like to, I think you can motion for one person to participate on it if you'd like to participate on it and to establish a working group to look at the zoning. Um, okay. I, I just that, think we ought to try to help out with yeah, the action. Yeah, well, I think yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. I think we should take the lead on starting it. Great, promoting the idea. Okay. You know? So does um, why don't we do this in two steps then? So does well, someone want to make a motion to establish a working group um, towards uh, looking at zoning issues at the, uh, the at the center? I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have a volunteer that wants to be kind of spearheaded at the uh, working group? I mean, I'm interested to it. I think you might be interested to it. I'm interested we'll, as well. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I only worry that I don't bring all the expertise on the permutations that might really be helpful here. But, well, but we, I am interested, well, yes. So, I mean, so why don't we do this, John, if you would at least be spearhead the working group. Two of us can go to any meeting without yeah. any issues. Three of us can't go because that would be an open meeting yeah. while having a quorum. But so the two of you yeah. could work on it. And we'll officially have you kind of spearhead the working group, but you can participate as I'm, much I'm, as possible. I'd, I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, very uh, interested in participating, yeah. And then when, then when there are meetings, John, if you could just send an email just Letting us know. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if you have an interest as well. I don't mean to squeeze you out or anything like that because I know, I know you talked about. <laughs> you actually were very passionate the last meeting when you were talking about the building yeah. and everything. No, I am. That, I am yeah. definitely interested in the issue, but I worry about taking on another commitment right now. Yeah. So I think I will seat this at this point. But if it, if you can keep us in the loop and if right. people yeah. are not all going, if we don't get into open meeting laws, if somebody. Is not going. I would be happy to attend. So, okay. That, and Great. You guys will, in, and we'll get everyone's contact information and, and set that up. Thanks for Great. <coughs> Jean, do you, can we go to uh, the 142 Green yes, Street since we have be, folks that would be here? My um, okay. So let me just kind of introduce this. So I know. We have, um, yeah. So we have received a bunch of correspondence CC to us regarding 142 Green Street. Uh, communications to the building inspector, communications from the building inspector, we've been CC'd. I don't think that we have any role right now in this. I don't see any questions to the planning board. Um, so I don't really want to get into a big debate about it. So I guess, Gina, if there, have you, there been any questions directly made to the planning board that you've seen? Not that I'm aware of. So I, I know okay. of um, this correspondence between the building commissioner and residents as well as the homeowner of 142. Right. And so the reason we put it on the agenda is because there was, you know, mail correspondence addressed to us. I think it's important to formally recognize that we've received it yeah. to at least place it on file. So I know that there are people here about it. Um, to the extent that you would like to say something, or let's put it this way, if you have a question for the planning board, you can ask. I don't know that we're going to necessarily answer it because I haven't seen anything that actually deals with an issue that we would deal with. It seems like it's an issue with the, the building inspector, maybe the zoning board of appeals. I don't know. Not, not a planning board issue there's, as of yet. So if there's a specific question for the planning board, be happy to hear it and decide whether or not it relates to us, and if not, our intention is just to place this correspondence on file um, 
because that's why we put it on the agenda. So I, I didn't mean to hopefully get people's expectations up that we would have a big discussion. Uh, okay, so if anyone has any questions or things for the planning board, please state your name and we'll see what we can do. I live at 20 Parker Street. I live across the street from this particular property. The main reason that we came when we saw that it was on the agenda was because the planning board has helped in the past with every part of this um, article. This article pertains to um, 4.122, um, section 14, um, uppercase letter B, A through I. And the planning board was intimately involved with helping us craft and um, those articles because Back in 2004, there were uh, a number of conversions that were happening. Um, people, it was a situation in which there were a number of uh, de real estate developers that were finding parcels that met the uh, zoning um, requirements in terms of um, being a conforming lot. And because it was a conforming lot, it didn't require any um, special permitting, and it went they were able to put on these unsightly conversions where they were putting um, things up. So the reason that I was had to welcome the opportunity to come and, and send it to you is because there may very well be the necessity for us to be, revisit this issue because this homeowner has been allowed to, to, to in essence, convert the property, has built a sec second property that is the size of the first. Uh, the only thing that connects the two properties is a small breezeway. And I know that this is not your issue. I know this is between us and the building inspector, but his interpretation of a, um, a, um, a, of a dwelling space mm. was because it doesn't have um, hinge doors or door jams, and because it shares um, the um, same utilities as, as, as the initial property. But if it you go and take a kitchens? drive by it, if you go take a drive by it, at the, it's on the corner of Poplar and Green. It is a, a, a house that is the same exact size as the original structure. It is separate hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But yeah, to, 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 we'll, we'll. So it, it does. It does have kitchen. <coughs> it does have sanitary facilities and kitchen facilities, which, again, according to um, 4.122.14e, if you add cooking and sanitary facilities, it um, creates a separate dwelling space. Okay, so, so the reason I'm bringing it, I'm glad that you get, I sent it to you and I'm glad that you're putting it on the agenda is if we're now finding more creative ways to convert properties in um, R4, then it is the planning board that we be, would be coming back to um, so if we don't prevail on this. Potentially interested in a potential change, that's why. You're if, if that's necessary. Yeah. I mean, whoever thought that that's what somebody would do, that they would take a, an addition and create another house with an okay. addition. All right, so thank you for the information. I, mean, I think that's fair. I think you, you established a broader context. I happen to be the one member of the board that was Yeah, I was going to say, you're the only, so only, only sort familiar, of familiar face. With it. Uh, we have, we are, the people that are here tonight have been here for everyone since back in 2004. It's, yeah. been, it's been, it's a very vulnerable section of town. It's, and you know, who thinks, you know, at, at times that it's going to be more, more, you have to get more and more creative about how to block conversions in this part of town. Uh, right, and I think it's it's fair enough because I think when they, my recollection again, it's a little hazy. You yeah. live it every day, so you know more of the details. But there were a couple of these conversions from one to two family. You sit there and you scratch your head and you say these things are insane. Would you really want to live in a neighborhood where everything is basically the same and you have something like this? So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out a way to do it that kind of made common sense that would allow people to do certain things but not other and the things. The application could have been applied for. Could have been a. Um, and it's a. It's a mother-daughter situation. It could have been, It was a choice on the part of the homeowner. They, it could have. They could have applied for a family suite, or they could have applied for a conversion and built something that was um, compliant with our current laws. But they chose not to do that. They chose to, to build an addition. So this is. I, I want to get the vo the word out there that this is another threat to R4. It, and so we may want to just look at it. And I think, you know, again, I think broadly put your, you know, your recourse in this case is the recourse you have under the law, mm -hmm. uh, which is your But the other thing recourse. is, is that it's a, it's, a, it's a conforming lot, and that's the other problem. All the rest of us that are here that live in the library area, we don't have a conforming lot. But so we have to go to this before the zoning board for everything that we do for a special permit. So those people that have conforming lots get at, at right now, there's a there is a serious um, loophole that they're using, and I, I still disagree with the um, building inspector. I was asking him to put his his um, his definition of a, what constitutes a separate dwelling space into into um, writing, which he has been unwilling to do. So yours is separate dwelling space. 
It, it's it, according to the bylaw. If you look at the definition by, uh, on uh, 4.122, 14 e, it says a s separate dwelling space is created when kitchens and sanitary facilities are added. Thanks. Okay. Well, right. thank you for the con well, the context is helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. All I right. appreciate it. Sure. Again, just to understanding that our general role is understanding the context of why the planning board might have some role in this discussion. So, sure. All right. Sure. Yep. My name's Kim Reardon. I live at 62 Parker Street. And it is funny, Mr. Simons, because I was looking back at the files and there was your name in my notes. I was like, wow, he was there back then too. So um, I think it's one of those situations where, you know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And what I, I think what caught everybody's attention, um, as Peg men mentioned, none of us had to be notified. Um, you know, there was no variance, no nothing. No butters had to be notified because it was a conforming lot. Um, the way most of us found out about it is when it started to be built. And you just cannot miss it. And I would encourage you to just take a look. Um, if you're coming up Mass Ave sometime and you just want to take that left onto green, you won't have to go very far and you will see what we're talking about. So little white house with another big white house being slapped behind it. And um, I think the, the phrase that I want to leave you with is that it feels like an incremental co conversion. So they're pushing it as far as they can and still staying within the, uh, the parameters to keep it legal but it would not take a whole lot more to uh, make it a two family. And so incremental conversion, it feels like, you know, they're, they're creeping up on it and then sometime down the road would try to just um, convert it. So, I, so yeah. thank, thank you for that again, you know, any, issues with that would have to be with the building inspector and the ZBA, even if we did change zoning, it wouldn't, we can't really help your particular situation that's ongoing, mm -hmm. even if we had an inkling to do so. So I just wanted just, just to be transparent about that. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Just one more follow-up. Yep. It, it could make a difference to our situation if we could get um, a zoning law passed um, defining what those two things are, because then they would not be able to um, go for a conversion. If we, you know, had proved, if we have a zoning law that defines exactly what um, an addition is because right now we don't. It's, it's being left up to the um, building inspect, inspector to determine. He's, he's not looking at the fact that a dwelling space includes a, a, a kitchen and a, um, and a sanitary facility. Like he's... <coughs> right, yeah, I mean, the, the question is how specific do you have to be? Apparently uh, you have to be, apparently uh, you have to be very I mean, specific. Again, and you know you have existing recourse mm -hmm. to go to the ZBA anyway mm -hmm. uh, if you disagree with the decision mm -hmm. of the... Uh, Building inspectors, okay. so that that's a right you have. Okay. Uh, Thank now you. Anyway. Thank you. Else? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming uh, and bringing that uh, information forward. No. All right. So, do we have any other articles to talk about? General code article. Um, so I do not have the draft warrant article. My understanding is the town manager is writing it. But we are undergoing an effort to do a bylaw recodification, and um, it goes beyond the, just the zoning bylaw. However, that I do anticipate being a zoning <coughs> amendment, and we'll have to go through our public hearing process. So again, I would like to include this on the legal notice. Um, but General Code is the company that is doing the recodification, and for the most part, it is just simply reorganizing our bylaw to be consistent with the town charter, the general bylaw, the zoning bylaw, subdivision rules and regs will all be in a format similar to what is displayed on the screen. So this is a preliminary draft just of the table of contents. And it's taking the existing zoning, reformatting it, renumbering it. They've also identified some um, things in the bylaw where over the years things have either dropped off, where we have the original <coughs> article that had been passed that we've asked them um, to include those type of revisions, so the non-substantive revisions that errors have happened. Sentences have just ended on the third word and <laughs> we can find the warrant article of what it's supposed to be. Um, so there will be those type of changes as well proposed at town meeting. Um, should this 
be passed, I would anticipate again that it would be first on the zoning articles, and then all the ones that we have crafted using our traditional format, they'll have standard language in them. Again, this is what I'm anticipating happening, but there'll be standard language that says that the renumbering according to the approved recodification can take place for these articles as well. So they would just be inserted into that format. We did this in Beverly with uh, General Code, who worked out really well. Um, they really do a good job cleaning up um, zoning and other bylaws that, by their nature, just kind of spread through the years, kind of like a fungus, and trimming it down <laughs> into something that's manageable and something that makes sense. And it'll grow again, but, but they do a nice job. And basically what it is is they just recodify everything, put everything in the right place and then do that first and then later on they'll go back and make substantive changes. Hey, do you really want to say this here because these 10 places in the code you use this word and later on you use this word, what were you really, what do you really want? Um, this law is old, you know, do you want to replace it with the new law? That'll come later on, so. Yeah, so this is just a real pass at cleaning it up. And the master plan effort, the second stage of that is going to be doing the comprehensive substantive type changes. Um, <laughs> this one is pretty straightforward, and the, the good news is once it gets online, it's really searchable. It's, yeah, it's, it's great to search. much, much better in terms of trying to find you the information. Any of the text no. Either. Again, other than those where we were able to go back to the original Warren article and tell them, yeah, that sentence, I mean, we have sentences that just end, John, mid-sentence. Mid <laughs> Over the years, they either just a cut and paste or something has happened. And so yeah. we... I think, for the most part, they're all tied back to the original Warren article where we can prove that it's well, non-substantive, we just need yeah. to fix it. Yeah. yeah. So are we generally supportive of putting that in the legal notice? Yes. All right. Very good. Uh, just uh, can we go back to 142 Green Street, just can we have a motion to receive and place on file the correspondence that we got so it's officially part of our file? I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. So what do we got next, Jean? Okay. Wireless. Um, Notification proposed article, so to extend the notification beyond the standard 300 feet as required by Mass Law. And there's nothing new on that, right? Nothing new other than I provided an explanation, which I apologize, but I didn't send it out. I think I sent it out late today. But um, I ran the explanation by town council, <coughs> just I have to cast it. Um, just straightforward to provide notice to parties of in interest for this for this specific use beyond the general law chapter 40a section 11 notification requirement i have left the proposed well the very first word was spelled wrong so um i have fixed that typo and have left the abutters to to abutters within x feet of the property line and that was still up to your consideration uh, I also did speak with town council about it, and you know, I, I, I understand she's hesitant about changes that go that are different than um, uh, what we have for other special permits, and that the um, federal law says we can't unreasonably burden um, cell uh, towers and cell facilities. Um, but I did explain to her that, you know, I think the consensus of the board was that we wanted to do something more than what there was. So she did suggest that if we do make any changes, that we really, um, at least on the record, explain why we're making the changes that we're making. Okay? So I guess I'd put it out to discussion about what we think. Um, I think there was a consensus for change, what we would like that to be. So any further comments or motions that anyone wants to kind of put forward? We had talked about 500 feet or more than 500 feet. Uh, I know I had talked about 500 feet. I know Peter, you wanted more. Then you had talked about maybe some other hybrid type solutions. Um, do you want to, add, you want to add more thoughts about that? Um, well, was that hybrid solution something you discussed with town council? Or is that fall in the category of things she's uncomfortable with? Yeah. Yeah, she was more uncomfortable with anything that, that went outside of what we were just, you know. What was in the rate for what we do for other special permits? Why is this different? Um, I, and I think there is a concern with the hybrid about either putting the burden on the applicant, which makes it potentially unreasonable, you know, to a court. You know, I, I think we could differ on whether something's unreasonable to a cell company, but uh, a court courts often have different views of that. And then what would be overly burdensome on our own town staff in terms of you know, figuring out notification 
costs of notifications, things like that. Um, and the openness of one being certified, one being just regular mail, and, and whether that would be susceptible to a challenge as well. Um, my, my, my thought would be maybe, I like moving it to 500 feet. I think a cell tower is really inherently different, a cell facility, than anything else that we deal with in terms of height, in terms of um, impact on the neighborhood, in terms of you know um, the aesthetics, and in terms of how it really seems to affect people, property values, things like that. There's, there's just so much that it potentially affects more than um, other things that I think are more localized to that 300 um, foot range. So I think 500 is appropriate. I'm personally hesitant to do any formal hybrid just because I, I, I worry about the federal law and I worry about things differently, uh, being different for different special permits. But I would say that I think that there are internal mechanisms that we can take. So for instance, if we get a cell tower application, I think that there are ways to put it out on social media to be pay extra attention to getting that information out there, <laughs> having planning do it, having us taking some responsibility to do that informally. That way we don't have any added burdens, but we know that we're doing everything we can um, under the law, but also outside of it, not outside of it, in addition to it, to get the word out. So. My thought would be just to make it 500 feet based on the extraordinary impacts that a cell tower has. So I, I think three, 500 is better than 300. And um, I think a distance to a butter that applies generally is kind of arbitrary for something like a, a cell tower. However, the thing that appealed to me with a hybrid type of approach was not the part about certified versus non-certified. That did not appeal to me for the reasons Gene stated. What, what I like about a hybrid approach is rather to scale the range based on the height. And, to, and, and maybe it's too complicated. Maybe it can't be done. But it did appeal to me that the starting argument is not 300, it's 500. But above a certain height, the 500 increases. Why? Because the higher the tower, the more visual impact there is. So, I mean, you could argue, um, why is 300 not arbitrary for a tower? And why is 500 not arbitrary for a tower? Whereas if it's based on the height, I mean, if you extend the argument all the way out, which I'm not suggesting, but if you were to extend the argument all the way out, it would simply be whoever can see that balloon test gets notified. Now, I'm not suggesting that. But I, I say that only to sort of uh, illuminate the point of the, the part about hybrid that appealed to me was you, you have a set range, you go above that, then that range scales out. So something on the lines of, would you suggest starting at 300 or starting at 500? No, I'd suggest start at 500. So start at 500 for up to X amount of feet. <laughs> right. And then if it's a... If it's above X, go to 600 or 700, something along those lines. But that's what you're talking about. If, if that's not too complicated. I suspect it's too complicated. But I mean, I don't think it's too complicated. I just don't know how much data we have to support right. those numbers. Right. But I don't think it's complicated. You could say 75 feet and above is 500 feet. 100 feet and above is 700 feet, and 125 feet and above is 1,000 feet. I mean, you could, it's, not, it's simple to figure out um, in terms of the application. Uh, then what happens though if someone changes, like this time, right? They went from 135 to 115. But what if they go up? Or, you know, what if it changes? Do we have to do notifications again? Things like that. There are. I mean, the logic behind it is the higher, the higher it is, the greater the impact, the wider the notifications. Where that pole is going. Yeah, I mean, if it's on a facility that's already existing, say it's on a tower that's already existing, you know, so. So I, I'm not hard over, I'm just expressing yeah. that appeal to me. Uh, if, you know, the sense of the board is 500, I'll stop, I can support that. Well, we will we'll have uh, public hearings on this. There's certainly more talk about this to, to be had. Um, but there's also something to be said for not 
complicating matters for the moment, just putting a uh, <coughs> agreeing upon a number, getting that in front of town meeting, mm -hmm. see where see how that plays out over the next two or three applications, and um, leave to this board or future members on the board to um, to, to assess that to see if it's remains effective or, or not. Yeah, I I like the suggestion of moving it up to 500. I think given the visual impact and all of the factors we considered in the last application with the impact on property owners spreading a little bit further than other special permits, I think it's important to increase this and I'm comfortable with 500. I also think that there's nothing stopping us as a planning board when we get an application, if it is for a tower that we think is going to have a big impact on more people given how it's sited, right? So if it's a, as we learned, if it's a tall tower but it's buried in the back of some lot where nobody's ever gonna see it, we don't really need to do another step. But if we think it's another tower where it may have a big impact, there's nothing stopping us from taking our own steps to notify more people. Um, whether it's through social media, whether it's asking Gene to pull a list of who are the people within a thousand feet, can we do we have like can we mail them something ourselves from the planning board? Can we do some sort of notification? I think as the planning board, we have the power to to sort of take those sorts of steps ourselves. And knowing that what we've been through, that we are going to be reasonable about this and try to reach out to other people, I think I'm comfortable increasing it to 500 and dealing with towers that will have a bigger impact. As, they, as those applications come up. We could even have you know, to be considered our own rules and regulations about heights. You know, if, if it is some height, you know, we could have our own rules about what we do. Um, something to think about in the future. Okay, so I think the consensus would be then to let's publish it with a uh, change to 500 feet. And then I, I, I think Aaron's point is good too. Let's see what comes out of the public hearings. Maybe there'll be some ideas that we haven't heard about, some ideas against it. Let's see what the public has to say and keep kind of doing our own um, <laughs> research too. I, I'd, I'd be curious if we could find out, at least, I mean, we haven't had that many applications, but of applications maybe locally, what the heights were. I don't know if that's available or through, through some the of the networks. Heights of the existing towers that we have? No, just in applications in the last couple of years here and over local towns. Like, where, have people been coming in for 180 foot towers, or have they been coming in for 110 foot towers? Well, because because we're all over from, the place. From, from the applicant, and, and I think our consultant that, that that's there. There's a there's a height at which it it, it you're, it's be you're, you're, you're overkill. It, right. You're 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 less you're lessening the coverage yeah. rather than um, providing coverage. Um, but but I don't know. It's, it's no harm in, in looking at such things and well, trying could, to understand the problem. Our door I think the last one permitted was 125 flagship drive, and I don't know the height of that, but it was in an industrial area, okay. and we did not get this kind of feedback at all. And right. I, I think it was well over 100 feet. Okay, so um, end on the air. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep we'll keep looking at it. And, and the, you know, the ones on top of Boston Hill, I, John, you might be able to speak to it. I now see that from tremendous distances. I never thought to look at it. Um, never noticed it before until this application. The one at Chestnut Street, when, you, when you're in the Willows yeah. Industrial Park, you can see the one at Chestnut Street. I mean, it's just... So you're that. blaming John for that? No, yeah. I'm just saying, I don't know what the public comment was at no, that time. No, in both um, of those cases, they were pre-existing. <laughs> Okay. Those were always there. I mean, they, they, they have been there for 50 years. Okay. Uh, it was just a question. Because they're not monopines, they're just uh, each they're time, monopoles. Each time you added to it, it was a public hearing. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And interestingly enough, when the hearing that far and away got the most people church. was the one at the church. Yeah, in a steeple that you weren't going to see. So. Yeah. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with visual impact right. at all. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So. We'll sponsor that one at 500 feet. Submitted. Okay. Lastly, I believe, is the solar bylaw. And I do want to kind of walk through the changes since the last meeting on that one.
So I, I believe since the last meeting, I have formatted this in warrant article language. Um, so it has a title, and as I said, the the definition section would amend one section of the bylaw. So it is now formatted to have the definitions. Um, our definitions today are in alphabetical order, but we did not leave spacing to add new definitions. So I've put this at the end, and again, I trust during the recodification, we'll be allowed to put this in the right order. Um, so the primary definition is solar, and then all these sub-definitions. Um, based on some comments at the last meeting we got in the scale of these uh, small versus medium versus large, um, I did have discussion with Aton in between the meetings, and we have proposed to um, lower the large scale from the 40,000 square feet, which is in the model zoning at the state, down to 10,000 square feet. The medium would be between the I'm sorry, we lowered the small scale down to 1,000 rather than 1,750, and therefore the medium would be anywhere between 1,000 square feet and 10,000 square feet. And where that becomes, um, I'm gonna go back to this height one, but where those dimensional requirements in terms of square footage come into play is when we're going to do either an as of right or site plan review or special permit. Um, so now those medium scale would require site plan review in residential as well as, I'm sorry, in a primary use function as residential in whether it's R1 or all other residential districts. Um, and as an accessory use, they would require site plan review in residential and they'd be as of right in commercial and industrial districts. Okay, and large scale would require, again, as a primary special permit in R1, the example there was the Brooks application that you had received, and it would require site plan review as a primary use in commercial as well as industrial districts, and would not be allowed in all other residential districts. Large scale as an accessory use um, would not be allowed in residential districts at all, and they would be by special permit in business and industrial areas. on that okay as far as the height of these structures and again at the last meeting I had shown images of a solar structure that is ground mounted um, however it is on one pole with a fairly large structure um, of a set of panels um, that could be approximately 20 feet high and the dimensions were 20 by 20 it overlapped the pole so the pole was 10 feet um, Given that we have, as you saw tonight, in section seven dimensional requirements specific to height exceptions, and so I've added in this underlined language under number two for, oh, why didn't anybody tell me I'm not casting? Um, so under number two, we, we ex exclude things like skylights, tanks, bulkheads, penthouses, chimneys, ventilators. I've added roof mounted solar systems um, to that, however, no roof-mounted solar system shall exceed 24 inches in height. The worst fear was somebody puts a pole-mounted system on top of a roof, but we have seen through the Osgoth. <laughs> That's why I've added that, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, but we have seen in the Osgood landing 18 inches they could get that height of that roof mounted system so this is 12 24 inches and I've also added a number to this section for ground mounted solar energy systems the max height of a small and medium solar energy system shall be X feet and the maximum for a large scale should be 10 feet the large scale is consistent with other bylaws that I had researched in the state however I wanted just to discuss the small scale and medium scale because that one panel would be the small scale. We're saying small scale is allowed as of right across all zoning districts. However, this would be kind of a catch-all for that. Um, the image you saw was 20 feet high. So I don't know if you want to use 20. I don't know. I don't know the technology well enough to say they could have done that at 15. You know, it's all, I'm sure, the surrounding tree cover and, and angle of the sun. So. Medium scales are taller than the large scales? Because it's the footprint of the ground, so the square foot we said for small is up to 1,000 square feet, and those, that type of ground mounted system I think is newer than the state model zoning, and I didn't see it accounted for in the other zoning bylaws I looked at. And so my concern is, I mean, somebody, 
I've heard in Boxwood there is a residence that has three of those. Um, so that's one concern. The surface area still would not add to much. So you want to, again, I don't think I'm as familiar with the pictures, but everybody recoils and says they're horrible looking. It, you almost want to work backwards from the thing you want to prevent, you know, to what the zoning is. I, I mean, like, you know, if one of these things is 20 feet high and I don't know how wide, it's one thing if it's on a 5,000 square foot lot, it's almost impossible to do, but if it's on a 500,000 square foot lot, you probably don't even care. Uh, so it's a little bit like, let's regulate what we want to regulate and not regulate, you know. That's where, I mean, again, I haven't really thought too much about it, but it seems to me you would think backwards from what you wanted to prevent and you would, you would maybe make sure you caught those things. So I'm going to bring up the image, John, so you can see it. And I, I mean, I agree. I, I, I think we should encourage solar, but I don't want giant robot, you know, solar energy systems in somebody else's backyard, yeah. right next to their yard. They're so that's taken, John, from the corner of Stevens Street and Great Pond Road, um, where that A&R lots were done and it, we're looking up into 140 Academy Road. So you're right, that's set way back from their house. However, it is next to somebody else's. So that's the house that faces Great Pond Road just after the North Parish Church as you head down Great Pond Road's Hill before you get to the corner. And I'm not quite sure why it is in this way, but I have noticed. I mean, you, you, when you drive around that corner, you can see it. But so you it, see it when you're one, coming down yeah. from the center down Gray Pond, going left on Stevens. Just as you're going left, you look up there. And look the up. way it is now, it's a, in that photo. It's angled, you know, daytime position to catch the sun. And for some reason, when I see that, it doesn't make that big of a deal. But the nighttime configuration, when it levels out, because then you can see the underside. Yeah. It looks huge. <laughs> I don't know why it looks bigger yeah. when it's like this. So when you say it levels out, it, it angles this way? I know it rotates with the sun. Oh, it, it also goes perpendicular to the pole. Okay. Yeah, so the whole thing is just the horizontal. And then you can see the underside looking up, and it looks really big. But are those things considered to be like accessory structures where you have to have them? I mean, because, you know, obviously anything that is above an eyedropper in size, so to speak, you would want to have uh, a certain distance away from the property line, I would think. Or, you know. I, my understanding, it is a structure and it is accessory, so it should meet the dimensional requirements. We don't have different dimensional requirements for primary versus accessory. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, they're closer, but yep. there, there still are some. But this, so this is in the R3. And but the, the, you know, the problem is that given potentially the height and the mass, it's, it's, it's bigger than most other types of accessory structures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm showing that. I'll, I'll forward this to you. I mean, this is one that was in, in Beverly, in somebody's side yard. And so this is a... So, Gene, are you saying, going back I, to this, I think that's probably similar in size to this. Yeah, I mean it's. But I think the height, the height here is driven in part by the geometry. Right. The height of this pole has to be greater than half of the length or width of that total panel. Otherwise, it would hit the ground. And so, I mean, if you say the height of the pole can only be x, then that means the panels have to be less than two x. So when we're talking about height, are we talking about the height of the pole or the height of the whole thing? I was talking the height of the structure. The, the whole thing. Was what I think it should be. Yeah. Right. So that pole, again, my understanding is the pole's 10 feet. The structure itself is 20 by 20. It overlaps the pole, um, and it's angled. And so I'm told the top of that structure is at 20 feet. But again, it's sitting up on a hill in the backyards of the other. Well, so that's in there. The yeah. So I imagine yeah. that, I guess the question is, that not so bad if that's in your backyard in a small residential neighborhood 
then that's right on top of whoever lives next door. Right, yeah. You know, that's, that's where I'm more, yeah. you know, we're talking, I mean, how do we figure out what do we, in terms of setbacks and things like that? Do we have protections in place? Because 20 by 20, that's 400 square feet. You could do that by right in your, in a residential. So and do we have anything that says it can't be in the front yard versus yes. the, okay. so all that's all right. in the dimensional right. in that zoning that we're looking yeah. at. And those are I don't know why these other images aren't coming up, but they're they're similar. It's just they are, there's another house that also it's it, because this is on a corner, it's in the back of two houses. Yeah. Um, and we do have site plan review, which is good, but except wait, for so as of right, this is small. So this open question on page five, we've got a. Are you? Do we need to come up with a number that's less than ten for the small and the medium? Is that? I think you'd say we need something more than ten because the smaller ones go on. Right. Of being taller. So the the normal ground mounted ones can sit only eighteen inches high. I'm trying to account for that pole type structure, and if you're going to set a max on that, that it can't exceed, because it's considered ground mounted. Or else we create a whole other category and call it a pole mounted or something different. I I, that I think might be the way to go. Yeah. Because I think break it out as a whole different structure. Because the ground mounted ones, if you know they're five six feet off the ground, that's that's going to be okay. It's these ones that are up up up, yep. tall and then four hundred feet across, you know four hundred feet square feet. Those are the ones that are problematic. Okay, I'll see if there's I any. I mean, at, at some point, it runs into some of the same visual issues as some cell towers. I think right. about it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Is there any notification? Re I, 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 we didn't ask this. I didn't think about this at, at, when we spoke. Is there any notification requirement when something is like as of right? There wouldn't be, right? If you're building it, if it's as of right. If you're building something as of right, there'd be no notification. Yeah. yeah. So we just have to be careful with that, what we allow. All right. So applicability, um, I had run number seven by town council. She did not think it was necessary. It would be accounted for in the homeowners, um, either associations or covenants. The, again, under the dimensional requirements, um, just kind of belt and suspenders what we just talked about in section seven would also go in section 814. So I will revisit that to try to break out the pole mounted for that. And then as far as setbacks. Um, I mean, maybe like when pole mounted, you, you have uh, bigger setbacks, you know, for example. Yep. Um, Keep them closer to the primary structure. Yeah, yeah, or away from the property line. Right. You know. I mean, the problem is, you know, in some cases it's safe to screening, but the, <laughs> you don't want any screening because that's how they work. So, uh, uh, but nobody would care if you couldn't see it. Right. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, could we make pole mounted pole mounted site plan? That way, at least we know where they are. I mean, I don't know how many. Are I mean, the problem mounted. is, is they're at the minimus. I mean, I'm. You know, the, if, if, if this ends up being something that's ubiquitous and there's 50 or 100 of them, you know, a year or 200 a year, it would be a nightmare. Right. So there's, there's got to be, I mean, again, I don't know how the technology is going or whether there's a best practice on this or, you know. uh, We had an inquiry for one um, around the lake. I forget what street it was. They haven't come forward as far as I know. This is the only one that's been permitted. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, rather than take up your entire backyard with a ground mounted system, I mean, it seems the technology is going this way. Yeah, it's going this way. So maybe it's, in some <coughs> cases, better for you, but not so much for other people. So, yeah. So, but when I break it out, I will put it in that table of uses. And again, you can decide whether you want a site plan review. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th I think I'm going to think about it because if it was rare, I'd say maybe you do it that way if it's not, you know. Or maybe we started out that way, and if it's not, then we do a bylaw change. Maybe, change maybe. right. Maybe yeah. we started out. Maybe we we learn from the ones yeah. that come forward. All right. The yeah. biggest, I, I, as much as I want to um, encourage solar, 
we don't want to allow the thing that we don't allow and let it sneak in. So if we, you know, make something more, if we make it more restrictive at first and find out that we have a hundred applications, okay, then maybe we need to figure out wh which ones are okay and we don't need to deal with and make a change. But I think you'd want to go narrow at first, you know. But yet not unreasonable. But yet not unreasonable, right, right. right. Not unreasonable, so that's, that's right. Um, so on the lot coverage, again, just looking at other bylaws, I saw it handled two different ways. One was that solar energy systems shall not be included in calculations <coughs> of lot coverage, and the other alternative was it can be included, but only um, shall be based upon permeability rather than use. Only non-permeable surfaces on the ground will be considered lot coverage. Um, so that was indifferent. I saw it both ways. and. I think the model zoning called for it not counting to lot calculations. We don't count, we don't have lot coverage in residential areas today. Um, so it would really be a change in residential if you were going to count it as lot coverage. However, the business areas, we do have a lot coverage calculations. So, okay. so can we? Um I mean, do we have the general consensus that we support a solar bylaw? We just need to uh, play with the numbers, figure out how we want to. So we can think about craft the top, it. The same thing. Do the legal notice for it on the 20th. You have one more time. Yeah. I believe they're due on the 24th, and so I, okay. I just have to get them to the manager's office by then. No. Okay. Um, good. So. Good work. All right. So everyone, just say if I, I think the solar one is probably the one that we need the most. Kind of just some keen yeah. eyes on in terms of the numbers, what's small, what's medium, what's large, and then the idea of the pole mounted versus uh, ground mounted. And, and then addition, we want to make site plan, oh, special permit, or nothing. Sorry, I added an explanation. And again, I had town council review that. She's okay with it, but it's in your packet now if you want to redline that as well. Okay. And we have minutes. Yes. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Approve 5 0. Uh, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye.